And um, so these, these five areas, um, you, you should have maps uh, in, in your handout. Yes, is there? Uh, yeah, those right there. Yeah. So there's uh, we have we have six parcels. We own six parcels. This would be affecting four. So there, there'd be five natural areas on uh, four of our parcels. Um, and I'll just go through them real quick. Uh, on the Marshall Pond Tract, on the north end, um, it's the it's the north northernmost end, and that's a spruce fir forest with a uh, acidic sphagnum seep. Um, uh, so it's kind of a flooded spruce fir type forest. Um, it's the only spruce fir forest we've got in the 2,200 acres of land that we own. Um, and that's about 17.9 acres. Uh, all of these areas have been GPS and uh, have been tagged with natural area uh, markers. Um, so there's no work involved there as far as just identifying where they are, how big they are, and all the rest of it. Um, the uh, the other the, the the next one I like to point out is on the Little Sugar River Track in the southwest corner. Um, this is a, an Appalachian Cove forest with exemplary uh, vernal pools. Um, Appalachian Cove forest is something that you, you tend to see more over in Vermont, where the soils are sweeter. Um, we've got pockets here because of the bedrock geology. Um, and this is the only sweet forest that we've got on our holding. Um, so there's a, an unusual uh, diversity of uh, trees, uh, ferns, and wildflowers on this part. Uh, there's over 30 species of wildflowers in a relatively small area. And the, uh, the vernal pools are exceptional. They're uh, slabbing along a, a ledge. And so they're trapping a tremendous amount of water. They're, they're each about 300 feet long and um, 30 to 50 feet wide. Um, and so their value for a uh, vernal pool, you know, amphibians uh, require pools that don't have fish because the fish will eat all their eggs. And so uh, this is ideal habitat for Jefferson salamander, blue spotted salamander, a variety of frogs and so on. Um, on the north end of the Little Sugar River Tract is the um, uh, mature Hemlock Ravine. And this is along the Little Sugar River. Uh, uh, it, it includes quite a bit of frontage along the Little Sugar River. Um, this Hemlock Forest is uh, exemplary deer wintering habitat. This is where they go in the winter when, they, when, when times are tough, like right now, uh, because they get protected by the the hemlock, they've got a little something to eat um, and they just kind of tough it out until things warm up and then they come back out again. Uh, so they're, they're pretty important. They used to be protected specifically uh, back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, the, uh, that, that parcel is also uh, somewhat landlocked, so it, it wouldn't be um, an easy one to harvest if we ever did want to. Um, on the County farm property, there's a, a network of four cattail marshes that are interconnected. Um, and they're the only cattail marsh that we have on our land. And there isn't a whole lot of cattail marsh in, in these parts anyway. Um, the, the cattail marsh is significant for uh, a whole bunch of uh, wildlife, including muskrat, long-tailed weasel, uh, uh, ducks, mergansers, blue herons, bitterns, kingfishers, marsh wrens, and so on. Um, and then uh, the fifth one is on the sole property in the, on the south end. Uh, that's a mature white pine forest um, with a wetland complex that moves through it. So there's a, you'll, I don't know if you can tell, there's a stream that's running mm -hmm. sort of east-west. Um, and, and that uh, widens out into some open wetlands. We also have a forested wetland. Um, and so all of these parcels have uh, substantial amounts of wetlands. Um, uh, four of them, four of the five have trails that go right to them. Um, and, uh, and one is landlocked and one has been recently logged. Um, so, uh, 
Formal protection by easement uh, is, uh, is a way of protecting it in perpetuity. It allows these areas to develop uh, more, uh, even more older um, characteristics. And uh, it's a balance between all the other land that we have that we're managing quite intensively. When you're done, I got a couple questions. Sure. Um, it, it, uh, the, the, but doing an easement on these lands, it sends a message to the public and it, it, it indicates that we are um, managing our land in, in a balance between managed areas and unmanaged areas. It, it changes our uh, reputation regionally in terms of the partnerships that we already have in education and research um, and recreation as well. And unlike most natural areas, which get sort of closed off, ours have trails right into them. And so we would keep those. One has a snowmobile trail going right through it. Um, it's a way of sharing these natural features with the public. Um, and easements typically cost quite a bit of money, uh, usually $20,000, $30,000 in order to do the legal fees, um, the title uh, insurance, the, um, sometimes there's surveying involved and there's always an easement um, monitoring fund because again, this is <clears throat> in perpetuity. Um, the third party that takes the easement is basically committing itself to upholding the terms of the easement forever. And so they oftentimes they require the landowner to actually give them uh, a bunch of money uh, to, to cover that cost going forward. Um, but what we have here is an opportunity from the New England, uh, the Northeast Wilderness Trust or NUT for short. Um, they have offered uh, to go ahead and do this easement with us at no cost to the county uh, because it's in their interest uh, to have some forever wild land here. They've got 16 uh, parcels in New Hampshire, but none uh, in Sullivan County or Grafton County. Um, and they've got a total of 58,000 acres uh, in all of uh, New England, including New York. Um, so they've been doing this for about 20 years. They're considered the uh, go-to people for forever wild easements. Um, at Derek's suggestion, and I went to the um, uh, UBLT, the Upper Valley Land Trust, and talked to Peg Marins about that. I asked her, do they do forever wild? And would they have any interest in this? And she said, they do do them. Uh, they did one on uh, Mount Escutney. Uh, part of Mount Escutney, but that um, she, she couldn't take this on for a few years because they're all backed up. Um, and also, um, it, she, she understood, I told her that Newt was willing to work with us at no cost. And she said that was, would be highly unlikely in their case, that, that they would expect the county to uh, come in with, with quite a bit of money. Um, she said that a number of their staff ended up forming the Northeast Wilderness Trust, um, that they, they used to work for, for them and that now they, uh, they run new. And so she said they're a, a very respected organization um, and uh, that it sounds to her like we're getting a very good deal from them. So she, she felt that we were in good shape to go with them. Um, and other than UVLT, there's really no, no other land trust in our region that would, uh, that does that kind of thing. Um, so, um, so just to wrap up, um, in my opinion, we need a balance between managed and unmanaged areas. Um, the county's reputation and integrity as a public lands manager is enhanced if we do this. Uh, Public land is being held in trust for the public, so we need to conserve the natural resources 
among our other goals. It, it will enhance tourism in Sullivan County, believe it or not. Believe it or not, I'm the kind of person that when I go traveling, that's the first thing I look for. Are there some wild places that I can go to, to, to go check it out? Maybe I'm strange, but I, I've met a lot of people over the years that um, are the same way that I am. Um, you know, it, it, we it, always it, did that with our kids growing up. What's that? We did that with our kids growing up. Same thing. Try to find We'd somewhere yeah. nice to, to, to go to. Well, Commissioner Osgood sent us uh, a link actually of a place in Florida that is kind of a similar type of deal where it's a preserved natural area. And, yeah. um, it gets quite a bit of activity. Yeah. Um, I mean, if we, <coughs> we, don't, we don't advertise what we've got there, really. We don't, we don't make it known to the public that that land is available and there to use. Which, in know, some yeah, cases, we which do. this does absolutely nothing for. It, yeah. It's available. It's open. Yeah, it, it's yeah. there. It's on the trails maps. How does this change that? It changes it a lot because if if we were to do this, then we could do a press release, and the press release would be news. It would be news for Selby County to to actually. Uh, do forever wild on a portion of their holding. Do we do a press release when we did the forest plan? I mean, that would have done the same thing. This is wild. It's in the forest plan to leave it alone, not to log it. Same thing. Okay. Well, I mean, I, but, and first question did, did I miss a meeting or did we talk about this at a meeting? It was, it was a while ago. It was a while ago. Talking about oh, it. Yeah. Enter, entering into with Northeast Wilderness Trust. No, this is the first. Yeah. This is the first okay. time we've talked about it. I was going to say, it strikes me as a lot of work going down. I mean, we've got a contract ready to sign. Yeah. Well, there's there's no no pressure at all. It's just in order to even have the conversation, I had to bring it to the point where it was real. So, you know, now it's an opportunity, but it's not something that... I, I, I mean, we, we talked about these areas as being wild areas and they're in our forest land. I get that. So they're in our plan there. This is a forever contract with a third party thing that we're going to gift a right to forever. Um, and I don't see the benefit. No, and I, I wanna... you know, it's on the land. It's it's in our forest plan. Yeah. This is going to tie, you know, who knows what's going to happen. And it will involve somebody coming in every year, flipping around if they do it right, walking the property. Um, what are the disadvantages to doing this? Like, it, say if, if, if 10 years from now we decide to do something in that property as a county, yeah, is that a disadvantage by signing up with something like this? I mean, uh, it would be a disadvantage if these areas were places that we thought we would be developing, or if they were places that uh, for some reason we felt was it was imperative that we do something in, but. It just so happens that because the county kept on buying land, it, it managed the places that were closest to the buildings. And so they just happened to be on the edge of all of our ownership. Um, and I think that's why. These are places where uh, they weren't managed as much. And so we have more uh, plant life. We have more diversity of habitat. We have almost old growth characteristics. I mean, we've got 150 year old stands, you know, we're not at old growth yet, but we're close. And if we did leave it alone, we would get to old growth. Uh, I wouldn't live to see it, but the future people would. And it's just, a, it's a question of, you know, I, I, I was excited about this because of the destination council, the work of the, of the group that Derek's been doing because this is another way of bringing attention to this part of the world in a very positive way that would appeal to a whole This country. doesn't have anything to do with the woods being there, the woods being protected. It's still there. We can bring attention to the woods that there's hiking trails there, signing up with it, giving away our rights to a third party entity, diminishing the value of the land to potential buyers, which it does, is, you know, it's just, it's like here, I'm going to give you this, and it does absolutely. Not, we can still say the destination. Yeah, so look, we've got this hiking trails, we've got this wilderness area, yada 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 yada. Without their stamp, 
to me doesn't a lot and I think you know yes I hunt out places to hike and go with the kids and when the kids were little now with the grandkids where I can go I don't look for a stamp on it I don't look up where you know Northeast Wilderness Trust you know endorses it to walk on I mean to me it's it's a lot of work. It, it's a lot of work. It's a legal thing that we'd have to go through the delegation with. Um, you know, it, it's we've got one. Um, you know, the, at, at home we're in partnership with Land Trust. You know, we are going into forever partnership with these folks. And to me, I don't see the benefit. And plus, it's going to tie up. It already has tied up a bunch of Lionel's time. It'll tie up a lot more at this time. Yeah. I, you know, I, I enjoy the outdoors as much as anybody. Yeah. I go to these parks and in these natural areas I hike and I enjoy them a lot. Um, the only thing that, that, that I get worried about is that this is uh, taxpayers' land. It's owned by the county. Yeah. Um, and to, to actually lock it up into an easement or it may restrict future use of this property, to me is a little bit bothersome. I, I, I don't, you know, I, I, I really believe in protecting property. And I know a lot of homeowners that own a lot of land that have protected it. And they've locked it down and it's, it's an easement. Um, and it can never be used for anything. Um, and and I, I, that's different though. That's one person owning some land. But uh, the county, the county land is, I think, a little bit different story. Well, it's funny. I, I just want to say that to that point that I, I see it the other way around, that this is public land, and so it's held in public trust, and so it's 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 incumbent on us to ensure that some of the resource value of these places is protected in, in perpetuity forever. Uh, that that's part of what owning land is: is taking care of some of it. And, and using some of it as well. But you're, you're telling Joe Smith, I'm taking this from you. That's what you're doing. Well, you, I, you're saying, I know better than John walking down the street. And I'm going to do this for you, whether I, you like it or bleep them out. I'm not. saying if you, have, if you have a chunk of land, uh, does it make sense to reserve less than 10% of it for, for, for the future? That's, That's all I'm saying. That may be perfect for you. We did it. You know, we, we chunked off a huge part of the farm and did it. But I'm not arrogant enough to go to the next guy walking up the street to say, yep, they're going to do this. And that's what this is doing. I don't understand. You're saying the public should do this. Damn it. No, <laughs> you know, well, yes, you are. What we're getting at is the, um, what Commissioner Hebert's saying is the public owns this. Yeah. And you're saying, I'm going to do this on behalf of the public. Yes, exactly. Right. So you're telling everybody they should do this. I'm asking. I'm All asking. Right. Well, okay. it's, yeah, this is, this, is a, this is a request. Yeah. Well, and these, and that, these, that's what I'm... These areas were, were selected because of some unique features that aren't found right. and we, all we, across. We, it, so the, I guess the flip side of that coin is we're telling... I don't know if I characterize as we're telling the public what we're going to do, but by doing this, we preserve these unique things for the public to enjoy for, yes, in this case, forever. So we could argue whether or not we can protect it as is as long as the county owns it. And really the only disadvantage is if we ever did want to sell the land, because as long as we own it, we can we can pretty much, we can yeah. guarantee that it'll be protected. But at some point, everybody in this room won't be here anymore. <laughs> And so the question would be for perpetuity for the public interest, is there value in providing this easement, which would provide, ensure that that protection continues? It's just it's an open question. If the answer is no, then that's that's fine. Well, but we did want to. How, how much have we got in the, the easement on the property across the um, highway there? Well, how big is that with the the forever easement on? The... We don't have any forever easements. Yes, we do. No, we don't. It, the, the, so let me take a step back. There are different kinds of easements. Okay. There are no development easements. And, and that just means you can you can cut it, you can log it as much as you want, you can yeah. mine it for sand, you can you can do oh, what okay. you want, but you can't put houses on it. We've got two properties like that, our Judkins property Judkins, yeah. and, and our Marshall Pond. 
And those two are under a no development easement. It has nothing to do with logging. This is different. This is about biological legacies. Yeah. So we either yeah. commit to, to having biological legacies or we don't. And you know, if I live forever, if, if everybody in this room lived forever, then we would know that that it'd be fine. Uh, is it presumptuous of us to, to say that we think something should stay natural beyond our lifetimes? Maybe, maybe it is, maybe it is. But um, again, I, I know there are a lot of people in this county that, that would respect us for doing this. Uh, and I think it would be more than the number of people that would be upset with us in any way, given that we're managing intensively the rest of it. We are already leaving this alone. The collective we, have, uh, you know, in the um, forest plan, we're right. doing that for the time being. Right, yeah. and, and I'm not presumptuous enough to know, you know, and that um, the um, thank you for correcting me. The no development easement was bought and paid for for what was that? I think it was like thirty grand. I mean, this is value. I mean, that was not going as far as as you went. The difference between the development and the non-development. It's a, it's a monetary gift, you know, and, and I don't think, you know, it, it. Well, they don't get anything out of it. You know, it's not like they're making money on this. All they're doing is they're saying, yeah, we're willing to be the third party and we'll make sure it stays that way. It's not, we're not really gifting them anything. We're gifting the public the protection of these special places. That That's really all it is. Which exists now. But, but I just want to be clear on this. There's no financial benefit to the okay, Northeast yeah. Wilderness Trust by doing this. Well, I know that. Yeah, no, no I, I, I know that too. But we are, you know, it, it's, and just, yeah, I, don't know, I mean, it's just a forever, you know, I think we've done. And I, I don't know if I'm. I, I'm we, we can let the delegation take a look at it. Um, and see if they have a different consensus of it. Yeah, we can. They, you know, because they're going to have to anyway. Well, that, that would be a little different than what we were talking about. Usually it's first starts with the commissioners. If the commissioners like it, then it would go to the delegation. If the commissioners aren't sure about it and the delegation said they were in favor of it, are you saying that you would then be in favor of it as well? What's your feeling on this, Joe? I'm not. I'm. I'm more and more reluctant to to approve something like this, especially where some of this stuff. First of all, we got a piece of land that's landlocked, so somebody's got land around that thing that at some point you now they might want to do something and need an extra ten acres, and if it's on the outer edge of our property, and and th there's value to it, and we can sell it, and it's only ten acres of a big lot, um, why put ourselves in a box there? And uh, apparently a lot of these are on just the outside edge of our property. And I think we're putting ourselves in a box. I really do. I'm, I'm a little concerned after all of this. And if, if, you, if you want exposure, um, I'm not sure if I sent it to, to the other two commissioners, but that email I sent it, uh, of this uh, Circle B Bar Reserve, it, it actually names that the county commissioners put this thing together and that there's trails on it. and it, it's beautiful. It really is. And I'm all about trails. Uh, it kind of excited me about putting trails in the county. But I don't know as though we have to give our rights away. That land to... that you're talking about gave the rights away. That, that's exactly what that was. I, I looked it up. It did yeah, I'm same. sure. It, it's forever yeah. wild. That's what yeah. they're saying to the public is that it's protected forever. And that and that just a certain kind of a, a, a statement that you can make when you say, yes, we, we're willing to commit to this. But just, just, just mm -hmm. so you know, after you sent that email to, to me and to others, I looked it up and I was excited because I thought, oh, that, that means that you kind of understand what this would be about. But, so if we put this together uh, over time without spending a lot of money with trails and everything, um, Granted, it, we're not here forever, and uh, I would expect that maybe a, 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 some commissioners could uh, turn it over. But on the other hand, it would be foolish to turn something as beautiful as that over, even as the commissioners, without involving a third party, without needing to involve a third party. 
I'm I'm a little reluctant on this one. Once it's done, we can't reverse it. Right. Just like it's, the judge it's a done thing. So yeah. here's the, getting the approval process, and and this is probably something that's come up with Commissioner Nelson having been involved with the county the longest, because certainly we haven't done any real estate interest mm -hmm. transactions since I've been here. Um, this is the RSA that talks about, or Lionel alluded to a little bit, where there's, there's a two-step. It's the commissioners approving it and having it be ratified, as it says here, where I'm kind of squiggling with the, with the cursor, mm -hmm. ratified by a vote of the convention and the executive committee. So um, that's how we transfer valid interests of real property. Yeah. So it, it's, it'll be the same thing for the culvert. Yes. So you will yeah. have to approve it. And then the part two is to have it ratified. That's what makes a legally binding uh, contractual transfer right. of the interest. Yeah. So, well, um, do Judkins, um, the commissioners were all set to do a conservation easement on Judkins. This is before my time, but the commissioners had it ready, took it to the delegation, and a uh, section of the delegation said, Why well, the belief are you giving away this land? Um, you know, so it died there. And um, so then, well, when I came on, I said, well, fine, if we want to do this, we can lock it up. Let's start a, a fun drive and they can buy the, you know, which is the difference between development price and conservation price. And um, we raised money, I don't know if we use county money or donate the funds, but anyway, we, we came up with that, had it assessed and came up with that number. And Barty Flanders was involved and they fundraised Unity Conservation Commission mm -hmm. and forced uh, force fundraise for mm -hmm. several years and came up with the cash to buy the conservation easement. Mm -hmm. And that made the people that were saying, why are you giving this away happy? And, and so we, you know, we took that donation and for the, the county took that donation for the conservation mm -hmm. easement. But that was a, all told, it was probably a six year complicated process. And it was not well, this, by, yeah. this will be streamlined because they're offering to pay for it. So yeah. there's no need to fundraise. Um, but there was the thing you're giving away our property. Right, right. I understand. mean, that was the I understand. That's I mean, I think I see this as an extension of the of the journey we've been on with the land management plan. We surveyed intensively every nook and cranny of our land. We found these yeah. uh, distinct, significant, environmentally significant or distinct <clears throat> features. And so this is kind of like the next uh, discussion related to that is, okay, we've got these unique distinct things. Do we preserve them? Do we not? And that's all, you know, we just wanted to bring it forward because this is the process. We have to run it by you. And then yeah. if you guys are on board with it, we go to the delegation. Well, if you're not, then we don't. Uh, to me, um, they're preserved in our forest plan. And then in whatever it is, what this 10 year forest plan, when's the forest plan get looked at again? Well, yeah, I guess 10 years. Yeah, kind of were more like 15 to 20 on the last one. But yeah, it, well, it well, depends on who's out there. Yeah. You know. So, so in uh, 20 years, it gets looked at by fresh eyes. I mean, most of these, if my understanding is, they don't even have paths to them, right? So they do. They, they have trails. Every, every one of them? Four out of the five. Oh, four out of the five. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. there's the Bear Trail to the Marshall Pond. There's the Snowmobile Trail through the County Farm piece. There's that. There's that road that we were on in Stoll that goes down. Um, and then there's uh, what's the last one? Is it the Cattail on the back of County? That, yeah, that's there? that's County Farm. And uh, yeah, but how do you get to that? Well, the Snowmobile Trail. Oh, I thought that was the Hemlock Stand. No, the Hemlock Stand is the landlocked one. Right, that's where the Snowmobile Trail is. I thought. No? Uh -uh, no. Oh, okay, okay. All right. No, the uh, the cattails are across the street from the salt shed, if you know where that is. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's the main trail. The Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, but all right. It, well, it, how many how many of these types of easements are there in the state of Manhattan? Do you know? Yeah. Uh, practically there. none. There less than three percent of the entire northeast is protected as forever wild. And so these guys are very motivated. They're trying to double that number in the next 10 years or so, if they possibly can. A lot of people see this as sort of a critical issue. You know, are we going to develop everything we've got, or are we going to recognize that there 
that there's a certain amount of, of biological diversity that we need in order to survive, in order well, to do well. But I mean, there's a huge part of the state that's non-developable. And not very diverse biologically. So it, it, you yes. have to cross-reference. Well, what, what you, yeah, what, so you're saying um, there's a ton of conservation easements you know a lot of land and conservation easements and right. no no building right no. not no not no law yeah. yeah that's the difference there's lots of conservation easements and no building what i'd be curious to know what the value of the timber i mean what are we monetarily what are we giving up yeah i mean uh, i don't know we, we didn't we didn't do that we didn't uh, and we I, I thought asking it, but the, you know, and, and that's the exactly plan. what they'll be asking twenty years from now. Right. They'll say those. That's the, that's where the good stuff is. We really should cut those trees. Yeah. You know, those tree huggers. The heck with them. Let's get that money and give it back to the people, and then it's gone. And that's the thing. That's why we don't have any old growth. So what's what anywhere. happens after when forest reaches old growth? What happens? in this part of the world. I mean, they're not redwoods. When they get to be old growth status, what happens? They, they reach what's called a, 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 a state of, uh, of continuity where the, the, the amount of trees dying and the amount of trees uh, growing up is balanced and the big trees fall over and then a bear can get in a, a down log that's you know this big. So it dies and rots. It dies and rots and it's soil. That's how you make soil. Yeah. Is, is you have trees rot. That's what soil is. That's why when you try to farm a place year after year after year, you can't help but lose soil. And what does whole tree logging, they they leave, they leave take the log and leave everything else there to rot and make soil, right? Well, whole tree chipping, you mean? No, I'm not whole tree, uh, cut the length. Cut the length, yeah, they leave the branches. That's right. So they leave it there to make soil. So I, what I'm getting at is that they're not mutually exclusive. <laughs> Oh yeah, no, they're not. But the bigger the bowl, the more habitat it provides for. Uh, I mean, see, that's what gets me when people around here say old growth. It's like the redwoods; they're going to live forever. You know, if they get to be old growth and then they fall down and die. But yeah, the, you see, what people don't understand is that the soil is the old growth. It's not the trees. Right. It's the legacies that are there. The lichen, the the fungi have been there for twelve thousand years, and when you log that over. You're wiping out all of that. It's not just the trees. Old growth is, is the trees are just a little part of that. Okay. It, it's but, uh, so there's no, but uh, we're, we're getting it up. Yeah, we're, we're in the weeds <laughs> here. So, and, and it's an interesting Literally. <laughs> it's fascinating, but this <laughs> yeah. isn't part of it. All right, I'm all set. Thank you. So we will move forward with the culvert. So yeah. it doesn't have to happen today, but at some point, We'll need a motion from from you three um, approving this action, and then at the next delegation meeting that we'll have, and I've been talking with the, uh, Chair Cloutier about making sure that we add this to that agenda. Do you want to do the motion now and get it out of the way? I'm yeah. prepared. I would um, move to execute um, with the State of New Hampshire Department of Transportation District Two forage release document as presented today by. National Resources Director Chuk. Second. Second. Joe? Yeah, I'm second. Yep. In favor? Hi, Ben Nelson. Hi, George Ebert. Hi, Joe Osgood. I'm okay with using my stamp on that too, Derek. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks for all your work on that one. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> we will give it some. <clears throat> consideration. <clears throat> okay, um, so Kate Kirkwood is on her way here. She'll be here probably a little after oh, two. Live and in person? Live and in person, yeah. She's going to be in the photo op with us. So, oh, um, that's right. We can skip over her report so that she can do it while she's here. Uh, we're going to do the shout out. Item C is just a, just a statement. We, we did circulate the um, FY21 annual report. So that is done and dusted. Um, so actually, I do have the sober house update. Uh, but I, I thought it was when Mary was here. Um, so we got some, some better news on the sober house uh, this morning, actually. 
that Eversource is on site today and phone transmitter. Okay. So we should have permanent power uh, connected to the building today, which is good. Um, still means we have about another month. So I'm still looking at the middle of March for um, all the HVAC system commissioning, the controls uh, and the elevator repair work. So we're gonna stick to the plan, I think, unless you wanna do otherwise, but waiting until early May for a dedication ceremony, but we'll, we'll call it a ribbon cutting, but because <laughs> um, hopefully we'll have some people living in it by then. And we'll just have to plan the ceremony around you know the number of residents that we have so we'll figure it out and hopefully what's the, what's the scope of the elevator repairs um is that something where we could get another surprise or is that something that's just wiring it up no it's pretty much just wiring it up they had to remove the cab because they had to redo uh the sump drainage so they had to have the shaft all exposed and so uh basically just reinstalling it and recommissioning it is 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 what's left, but they, they couldn't do that with uh, temporary power. They had to have permanent power hooked up. Okay. So that was just a part of the project we knew was going to be held off until this stage of the game. So it's still going to be a slow boat. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Take the stairs. You can go probably three or four times up and down before one trip on the over here. That'll be part of our fitness plan. Well, and, and hopefully by May, COVID will have eased up and people will feel more comfy about coming in and going. With, I mean, they say it's coming down. So. Yeah, that and the weather, we won't yeah. be uh, trudging mud and slush so, through the building. Um, so a lot of reasons for waiting. <laughs> if we had to, we could do with people in there, we could do some of it outdoors too, you know, decent weather. Any uh, other questions on that? Well, we have our weekly meeting tomorrow, so we'll we'll get another update and see kind of where things stand. But, um, NHAC update, the uh, legislative items, you got the report here, which is just the report that DuPont gave to us. There's a lot of updates. The two bills that we're most concerned about, one of them that we know is going to get referred for interim study, which is the Nursing Home Capital Reserve Fund. So even though that bill is going to die, um, Representative Aaron did have some conversations with members of the Ways and Means Committee and the Finance Committee to talk about a single appropriation, whether that's now or next year or whatever. So um, cautiously optimistic that as those talks continue, maybe something will materialize. So we'll see. Um, HB 1565 is the opioid trust. Um, I I kind of threw in the, threw the, the white flag, I guess, after the last work session. I just felt like, you know, the, all the rational arguments in the world aren't going to change some committee members' minds, which is fine. They're you know, certainly free to vote their conscience based on whatever uh, they're looking to achieve or not achieve. So um, just seems like some of the questions that are coming back are just, I don't know, they just don't make a whole lot of sense. Um, so- George McGuire is gonna work it out. <laughs> well, he's never once came to any of those sessions to yeah, testify, no, so it's just, um, we, didn't, we didn't get a lot of support from the other counties or the municipalities. So I think that also sent a message to that for some reason we were the only ones that care, which is kind of silly. I mean, people are busy. It's really hard to get them to testify in person, but whatever. Um, there's another work session this week. I think it's Wednesday. They're going to actually take the vote. Uh, Representative Aaron is now on the committee. She said that there, there's been some discussion um, with individual members just talking to her. Um, so we'll see what happens. I don't know. I, I expect it'll be a split decision. They're going to unanimously vote it down. I just don't see that they're going to support it, which is frustrating, but whatever. Yeah. We tried. <laughs> um, and I don't think there was really anything else. There's a lot of county-related bills, but a lot of it's pretty low level. Dave, is there anything that you guys are tracking? That's worthy of commissioner's attention. No, nah, there's a couple. There's a couple of pieces around still where they're they're closing the swimming center. So they, they, we, I testified about what they were doing. If they they were yeah. the first building went to county jail to say, hey, we'll take the juveniles, and that was a big no from everybody. So uh, they're they're looking in other direction. We won't be doing the juveniles. They're also looking to potentially change the age. Um, which is contradictory to what they were doing closing the student center. They talked about 
making, including 21 year olds, 20, uh, 18, 19, 20 year olds as juvenile still, not okay. being adults so go to a juvenile facility. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff that's just wasting time. Taking um, back and forth to that every. Yeah, and the other thing that we're following, I testified uh, with Kate, Kate, Kate and I along with um, the sponsors of the bill, was legislation that was around telling DOCs that we have no authority to um, restrain a pregnant female. So regardless of her charge for classification, you can't restrain her. And they, they were taking it to a point where they were um, even trying to dictate what level of strength we could use if we did have to restrain them and who would be doing the transport. So again, that impacted all of us. Um, it would have impacted all of us in a negative way, but they we're not supporting the we're not supporting the bill, um, but they have made changes already that have put uh, the decision making on the DOCs and the DOC medical teams. I suppose you can restrain her, but probably the fetus is <laughs> well, what happens if you don't restrain them, they get hurt. Well, they get her, yeah, they, or, or yeah, that, that was our argument. So, so if I can't restrain some of this person that's a maximum security offender with, with um, serious violent history or history of flight, if they do flee, when people does flee, then we're, all, we're obligated to return to the custody. There's a bigger risk of an injury when they're wrestling with the person yeah. versus leaving a facility and, you know, in car, you know, with some. Some level of restraints on so it, it's it's not going back us at all even even uh if it passes as it's written we still have the authority and and they they've taken the piece out that required um females to supervise females mm -hmm. they, they put that in a male officer can't transport for their team and that's you know again that was explained to them that with the smaller DOCs I'm always stacked up fully so uh Anyway, it's, it's not really what happens. You gotta wonder sometimes, don't you? Who comes up with these, some of these decisions without rationally thinking everything out? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I found out that during the part of the bill was the ACLU, part of the drive to find out was the ACLU, and one of the attorneys from the office in Concord felt that he was restrained when he shouldn't have been. When he's incarcerated for the shoulder injury. So there's always there's always someone. Yeah, it's yeah. All right. Any questions on the ledge? Okay. Mm -hmm. Um on the economic profile, uh not a lot for this commissioner's meeting. Um we still are working on the destination council. The next um we're looking to do another public thing at the common man mm -hmm. at the night of the, I think it's the 24th. February, yeah, Thursday night. We've got a hold on the facility. So um, working the preparations for that. That'll that'll be a um, a meeting where Penelope is going to provide a, a, a summary of the survey. Yeah. And we had about 950 total survey re, uh, responses provided. Yeah, so yeah, that, was, yeah. that was pretty awesome. That's pretty good. Yeah. Um, so she'll do a quick thing on that. And then Chris will do a brief overview of what we did at the first meeting back in December for anybody who wasn't there. Yeah. And then he'll provide a, uh, a short-ish presentation on how he's seeing the... Um, the destination plan and the org structure plan kind of shaping up. And then we the, the intent is to have a lot of direct input from attendees and not get hung up in small group activities, but run it more like we did on the, the, the meeting several years ago in, in the Lou Thompson room where yeah. those people had a chance to, to say what was on their mind, which I think is what we're after because it's yeah. it's a pretty good crew for soliciting input. So, so tentatively for the 24th. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the destination council members, so the group of about 15 that we've got, they're working on a survey right now. And then Penelope is, uh, we're gonna be meeting with them in the next week or two to help prepare for that too, so. And that's really focused more on the sustainability of the organization that's gonna be responsible for implementing this and yeah. different funding models and just trying to get some input from them about what they see happening as far as that goes, so. Um, 
nothing on the workforce development uh, of note. I did have a quick conversation with General Polinsky at the Tech Center just to let her know that it looks like we'll probably need to do all four of our adult ed programs at the Newport Tech Center. Just to know what's going on with, one up with Paramount. Yeah. So um, she's on board. She said, I might need more time. So um, I'll need to get a year extension on that USDA grant, which shouldn't be a problem. Yeah. Um, trails project, nothing new to update. And the SEDS, I think I might have told you before, we had the, the SWAT meeting with Fort Well. So um, that is moving forward. Um, item five, at the top of the page. Two possible grant requests to make you aware of and then uh, get your approval to go after. Um, the first one is is still in draft form. It's a it's something that the through the Department of Commerce, the Economic Development Administration, has some decent sized grants. In this case, a five million dollar um, EDA workforce grant that we would be like we have been recently, just the, the pass through for. So we'd have very little to do in terms of active work overseeing it. But it's it's something that's uh, this. This, this concept of a workforce grant is something that some of the RDCs, the Development Corps, so Grafton County, EDC, uh, Southwest Regional Planning Commission down in Cheshire, um, City of Keene, Nancy Merrill and Claremont. It's been a group that's been talking about trying to do something uh, revolving around rebranding of this, like, this is not the phrase they're using, but it's this Maker Valley this region of makers, and it kind of extends from the Lebanon and Hanover area all the way down to Keene. And so they want to just do more to, part of it's going to be a marketing campaign to help continue to um, eliminate the stigma associated with manufacturing, that it's actually kind of hip and it's cool and it's not dirty and grimy and um, and hopefully make it appeal to younger people. Um, and it's anything from small businesses to go ahead and working at a large place like Wayland Ruger and everything in between. So that's going to be part of the effort. And then the rest of it's going to be um, more specific job training programs where they actually try to get people connected to some um, education and training and get them into the workforce. So it's kind of a broad ranging grant and we would be the, the pass through. Um, again, I don't know what the deadline is for this. I was just kind of brought in. We, I don't know if they had an original sponsor for this in mind and then I, for whatever reason it didn't fall, it fell through. And so they said, hey, try, go ask Sullivan if they help us out with this. Um, I'm not sure if that's how it came about. Is this through um, the state? This would be through the feds. This would through be the feds. EDA. Yeah. Okay. It'd be a $5 million. Because I was reading an article the other day that the state of New Hampshire, um, they're, they're um, not raising their tuition at UNH. They're leaving it level again oh. for the fifth year in a row. And then they went on to write this article about how it, it the impact to the uh, economy and the and the um, trades and the and the the economic impacts are, are really uh, benefited from it by not raising the tuition at the mm -hmm. college because it tends to bring more state students in that actually move back into the stay in the state and and work in those fields. Um, that that's why I'm wondering why they aren't promoting something like this statewide rather than just at the college. What yeah. they why not they put some funding in, into the uh, local tech programs and, and things like that if, if it's you know that big a deal. But, uh, yeah, they're having trouble with all the jobs out there and in carpentry yeah. stuff. They're, they're having trouble getting people into the tech center, students into the tech yeah, center. Yeah, they can't get them in. There's, there's, maybe, maybe, maybe some funding there by the state if they're doing it at UNH. Maybe yeah. it would help entice people to yeah. And PR work to say, hey, the jobs are, I don't yeah. know if they don't realize their jobs out there. It seems old. It seems though they're starting to figure it out, but yeah, it's that there are jobs out there. So I don't have a motion for that today. I just wanted to get it on your radar. Um, I, I don't know what the timeline is, to be honest. But um, appreciate it. And that's kind of what wound me up a little bit with the previous thing was like, it's like, it seemed to be down the road yeah, without, it's, without, it's hard to convey information to you without without having public meetings so it's kind of a yeah. you know we don't do pre-briefs because we do that no, but I mean, it was a mention so. in a meeting before it got 
Yeah. It, it looked like that was a ways down the road. Yeah. Um, the next one, uh, I would need a motion for because of the timeline. So this is something that uh, I believe I've brought up before. Kevin Peterson at CDFA approached us about trying to put in a grant for the capacity building. It's another tax credit. It's a segment of their tax credit program. And the capacity in this case would be an additional person that we would go out and hire with the revenue um, to do countywide economic development stuff. Yeah. So at the time when he suggested, it, I thought it was great, but what stuff would this person do? Yeah. But I think it's going to work out perfectly with as the destination council activity evolves and presumably comes up with ideas that are going to be um, gaps that would say, oh, we really need this thing to be an event or an activity or something in this area. Yeah. And it's going to involve, you know, a capital project to make it all come to life. Well, this is the person that could um, help figure all that out. If Penelope yeah. decides to stay with her current day job. Well, this is, I don't, I, this is different. This is a different skill set than Penelope. This is somebody who can go out, get funding, engage with architects, engineers, and make things come out of the ground. Oh, okay. So Got that it. would be the, the vision for this position. And I've been working a lot with, with Nancy Merrill in Claremont um, about the idea of it and just making sure that we're all on the same page as far as how this person would be utilized. So if they're a countywide asset, so they're a contractor for the county, of the 15 municipalities we have in the county, uh, two of them, Claremont and Newport, actually have economic development staff yeah. on their municipal staff. The other 13 don't. So if this was to go build something in one of those 13, well, that person would be the main person working with the select board, obviously, at their direction to do whatever it is that needs to be done. And if they're going to be working in Claremont or Newport, the understanding would be that they'd be an extension of those existing staffs. So it's not a matter of the, you know, the county competing with or conflicting with municipalities. It'd be very much complimentary. So uh, the deadline is um, March 4th. So there's about a month to get this request in. Um, you know, the application is just, it's just like any other. It's just going to take some time to get it knocked out. But if that is... Um, you know, if you're okay with it, then then I'll then I'll get started on it. Um, but I need to need your approval. So the timeline wise, so again, the summertime approval. If if we get approved, and if we don't, then it doesn't go anywhere. Then we have a year to sell the tax credits, and you can't spend the revenue until you sell the tax credits. Yeah. So it'd be probably about a year from now before we even have any revenue to hire somebody. Unless another option is we augment this program if we needed to do it sooner. Uh, and possibly you know, look at using some of the upper money, which I'll talk about um, in the next session of this. Are you going to write up a complete job description for us before you put it out? Because it's something I could read before you. Yes, before absolutely. You. We could do it that way, sure. Um, yeah, that actually would be something that would be part of the application anyway. Because it's easier, it's easier if we're going to push to sell credits for anything. If you know what you're selling, sure. And, and and some of these people that may donate may see an opportunity in it for them, because if this person's capable of doing something that's going to benefit their, you know, their, their in their business or and things like that, which which would be a lot of the people that I know, they would be they would be impacted by economic growth. So um, be a lot easier to sell them on that. So just a motion to proceed with economic development. Well, if if you want, I mean, we can we can wait to the next meeting. I can get the job description. We can talk about it at that meeting. Do it then, as long as I have a couple of weeks Consensus to get that. To, yeah, right. uh, I mean, I can get started on the application, so I don't leave it off for the very end. But yeah. um, but I don't want to get ahead of my. Yeah, you know. yeah, and I don't don't run yourself right you're trying to get. I know you've been low on your plate, so. The only thing we just have to be careful is, you know, I can see pissing matches between communities on, hey, that's something for them, not us. It's, well, it's, it's going to be, you know, what, what are the projects that pop up yeah. that emerge from this? I mean, we've talked a lot about having some Riverside yeah. venues for things. Uh, so does that mean the Connecticut River, which would mean any of the places from Plainfield all the way down to Charlestown? Yeah. Well, it's a good starting um, point. The Sugar River. Which it's a good starting point because yeah. then if 
if they've got if they know they've got something available as far as property or buildings or whatever, and, and you've got an economic person that can maybe bring in some funding for that that they don't that they can. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it's a good starting point. It, 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 at least it gets the ball rolling. Yeah, and maybe bring some interest in. And, and you know you're going to run into some so on with some of these economic groups. Some of them don't want to yeah. do things that, that aren't exactly in, in their their plan or their program. But um, a lot of them just it's a, it is a truly a matter of capacity. Yeah. I mean, look yeah. at the smaller yeah. towns in our county; oh, they yeah. don't yeah. have anybody yeah. uh, to do this, and yeah. it, it could be an opportunity, probably. If we think we're going to move forward with this, reaching out to the select board to say, "Hey, if you ever wanted to, you know, bring something to your neck of the woods, you know, think of think of this." Um, I think you'll find that all these all these businesses they've reached out to every possible contact they can find. You know, they use all the the, the job uh, placement agencies and everything else to try to find people, but for some reason they don't seem to get the the impact of somebody pushing an economic um, program that may bring in young people, may bring in adults for adult, edu adult education and things, things that they really aren't working on independently mm -hmm. on their own. But maybe if, if the county or the state got more involved in that, and it, it showed that there was a, a little bit different type of avenue and you had more, more access to different resources, Maybe then they'd be more willing to you know, get involved in it. Yeah. I think they're running out of clientele through these placement agencies. I, I think it's getting harder and harder mm. all the time. Yeah. All right. Uh, so we'll just table that then for the till the next meeting. Yeah. As far as the motion. Goes. But yeah, go ahead and I'll get started. Give consensus. Yeah. Um, and then the last one, just a quick update on our latest COVID program numbers. There should be an report in your mind that. And we've got about 10 minutes before the photo op, which is probably just enough time for Kate's update, which is back at the beginning of the <coughs> section three. Very front, yeah, no, uh, tab three. COVID, yeah, no, I was just looking for the COVID. Greg Sullivan? Well, no, the COVID numbers. I got the greater Sullivan, I don't see the COVID. Well, that's what it is. It's a COVID program. Oh, oh the dollar. Sorry. Yeah, See, yeah. I was looking for how many people had COVID the other year. Okay. Uh, um, look at that from Ted. At the beginning of the one of Yeah, numbers. no, I just when you said COVID numbers, I wasn't uh, thinking dollars and cents. <laughs> all right, Kate. What are you? How are you? You can sit right there. I'll be yeah. Hi, nice to see you. Good yeah. to see you again in person. Yeah, yes. I don't think I've ever seen you all in person. This is you great. might have one time. Once, yeah. The L will put you up better there than from the cheap yeah. seats. Oh, okay, sure. So um, you have the update, I think. Uh, you have yep. basically good news. You know, there's always a few little things. We've had some material delays and we've had some contractors, um, you know, sick and then it was holidays and then the car accident, you know, one thing after another, but <laughs> overall, um, I'm pretty happy. Um, the, uh, the new property in Charlestown goes out to bid tomorrow. Oh, so that's nice to be expanding outside of Claremont. Yeah, that is true. Um, we had one property that's gone all over the place, uh, Spruce Ave was originally four units when they applied. Then it went down to three because they couldn't get approval for the fourth unit. Then they couldn't get approval for the, or money, I guess, for the third unit. So it went down to two. And uh, then they just, they just disappeared, that property owner. Turns out they put the property up for sale. But the new owner not only has reached out to us and reapplied, but they're back up to four units. That's good. <laughs> yep, so there you go with that. And we just picked up um, another four unit just this past week uh, in the application stage. I haven't seen the applications yet, but it's under order. So I think that it will, you know, it will come through. They're, they're definitely low-income tenants. I'm going to go drive by it for the first time after I leave you here today. So if that's on Chellis Street. That's a fourth family under order. It looks pretty rough from what I can see online. I think it needs a lot of work, but I'll know better after I look at it. Okay, what's the zero mean for the units in progress? That's so. Those are all ones that are um that are exterior. We've already cleared the interior units, so okay. Going. So they show up in the completed ones up top. That's right. Okay, mm -hmm. gotcha. Yeah, yep, that's right. Myrtle Street is going to be beautiful. That's really a show place. It's yeah. going to be just gorgeous. It's on the it's on the historic registry. 
and um, and the contractor that's doing it, who also owns it, like you know, like John Nelson, um, is just doing gorgeous work. It's taking some time because he's right. been stepping off to do other projects for us, but yeah. it's uh, it's well, that's that one we'll right have. down the road from the dentist's office. Mm -hmm. There, it is a nice house. It's been in various states of repair for. Yeah. Ever since I've been going back there, it's a nice old building. Well, so our pipeline point. is, uh, we're almost out. Um, this doesn't really instill a ton of confidence that we should be going forward with round two, because that was sort of the assumption that we're going to bang out these 60 units and then be begging for more money. But um, I'm, I'm more than a little concerned that applications aren't falling from the sky. I mean, hopefully we get the radio ad, but boy, oh boy, I just thought by now through word of mouth, yeah. there'd be people knocking down her door and it just doesn't seem like it's happening. That is a huge concern from my perspective. Yeah, I mean, we do have uh, 22 units in the pipeline. Um, so that's, you know. Well, we've had almost that many I mean, that eight unit in Laurel has been there for five months right. and gone I nowhere. So that yeah, the number looks great, but I, I think we, you know, we've seen, we know the rest of the story, the Paul Harvey version. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. He did finally, um, the Laurel Street owner did finally tell me he got his financing in place just a week or so ago. So we'll see. Um, and the two, the Myrtle Street duplex is new. That one just came in. Um, yeah. And the, like I said, the Chella Street is under order. So that will happen, I believe. That's new also. I mean, we still have limited bandwidth for the our contractor pool is only is only so big. Yeah. So even if we had 80 in application phase, that would that would be probably three years worth of work. So there's a sweet spot where we have to acknowledge how much our contractor capacity is and how many are in the pipeline. But boy oh boy. You know what I, I um, really would love to um, be able to get some opportunities to speak to you know like a, a landlord group or a realtor group or something like that if there's anybody meeting these days either electronically or in person. Because yeah. I, I think that's a, a market where really not, you know, all we're doing is looking at people who contact us with properties under order. Right, right. Maybe the radio ad. We we have uh, we have spoken and we've got a, a script in process right now, Steve and I. Oh, good. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we, we, we've got two drafts, actually, that we're working yeah, on. I think the Realtors group is fairly active. Um, well, you she's been to the the greater Claremont oh, order okay. No, that was the one that I went to the wrong, I went to the wrong Come, common man, and I did not ever end up speaking there, so I should reach out to her. Again. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, we most, just miscommunicated about where most real are pretty active. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're dying for places to list. So if they, yeah. somebody wanted to clean one up to list, they would. Yeah, I'm sure they would be out. Now, the last I knew, the Claremont Realtors collectively got together pretty regularly. So if you got a hold of a realtor that could bring you in as a guest speaker on on that, that would work out pretty good. Derek set me up with one and then we just we miscommunicated about the date and time and didn't work, but let me let me try to reach out to her again. So about insurance companies, do they, I know they, they've gotten a lot more strict in the last several years about insuring properties that are, that are in dire need of repair and things. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's any, I haven't really thought about that, but we certainly could try. I mean, that's the kind of thing I think we need a new a new avenue to get the word out. The banks all know you're out there, right? I was going to say they would be the ones that. Is the under order list exhausted? The ones that nope. want to work or well, are I mean, eligible? We contacted them all, but it keeps growing. You know, there's there every yeah. ninety days they give me a new one, so there should be another one out in a couple of weeks. Okay. So we can move, we can move forward on that. Usually they come to us like this um, this uh, cellist one, but uh, if when they give me a list, if there's a new property on it that we haven't heard from, I'll definitely yeah. call them. So the underwater list is when they find elevated lead in the kit or something. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So those are motivated folks. Yes. That's why when it's underwater, we're pretty sure we're gonna they're not gonna go away. But we've got this, you know, just odd things like this woman who wouldn't let us come in to do the work. We scheduled work for January 31st and the week before she called and said, you know, kids are sick, you can't come. That was Woodland. Yeah, yeah, no, no this is, movement on that? No, I called her, she's not returning my calls. She's, she just clearly doesn't want to be this. But that also place. had grant money from Habitat. It did. So has that money been? Some, you, yeah, the work, exterior work's been done. We just need to get her out so we can do the interior. Okay. 
Well, they don't want to. They don't want to be displaced. No, they're busy. You know, she's working from home. Kids are in school. Yeah. So there's a you know there's a few like that that we just need to wrap them up and get them out. But also, of course, it would be nice to have a big pipeline. Contract. So any contractors are tough. Yeah. Everybody's scoffing them up. Yeah, that's a challenge right now. All the grantees are talking about it. All the other grant programs, same issue. All right. It's your time. Yeah. Anything yeah. else for me? Yeah. Well, thank you very can, much. Sure, I can come back after the pictures if there's not time enough. But if you're good, I'm good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're doing a lot of good work. So we are. Um, I guess we can call a recess. I'll pause the, okay. the recording so we don't have thirty minutes of dead air. Mm -hmm. And we're going across the river to do a photo op for the tax credit from um, Bar Harbor. Bar Harbor Bank and Trust. So we're just going to go across, do the photo op, and then reconvene yeah. and we'll get back in 10 minutes or uh, be closer to probably 15 or so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. just to let I guess there's no public out there, but just in case there is. We'll, we'll dub you a picture in, Joe. Okay. And that's a good one when you when you well, like. Yeah, you got the stamp. We need one of those cutouts. Well, they, <laughs> yeah. they got a copy of my picture somewhere there. <laughs> Put on a big piece of cardboard so we can hold it up. Right there. there you go. <laughs> All right. So we'll be back in a few minutes. Okay. okay. Recording stopped. I told her you pay for going into the lobby okay. um, and they'll do the photo shoot there. They may have you sign some photo release type forms. <laughs> and I asked her to share the photos afterwards. So. <laughs> Thank you. 
Recording in progress. Yeah, we we are a couple bullets with storms. I'm back on. Close to being that's about. Guess you never know in the south. Yeah. But for all the years that they've been going there, they've never had any type of tornado coming in here. Where, where is this? Sudden. What's that? Where, where is it? For my, oh, for my, uh, you know, the South becomes a new, more Tennessee and stuff has become the new tornado alley. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yep, yeah, let's do the COVID update. Uh, Ted, we'll start with you, the latest from the nursing home. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. The last uh, few weeks, we've been testing all residents and staff on uh, Tuesdays primarily. Um, we had um, a number of positive residents on Stearns 2 and on Macomb. And so over the last couple, two, three weeks, we've had 13 residents on Macomb, on Macomb and 13 residents on uh, Stearns 2 test positive. The good thing is, uh, at this point, we haven't had any residents test positive since last Tuesday, uh, February 1st, testing. And we only have one, one resident on McConnell who's currently under, under precaution, and another, probably half of them on, on uh, excuse me, flip that around. One resident on Stearns 2 is still currently under precaution, and about half of the residents have been removed from precautions on, uh, on the comp. So we're on the back side of that. So but we'll, we'll continue to test again next week. Any uh, severe symptoms or all? No, unfortunately, they've been relatively minor. Yeah. Um, Those who have been doing that. Symptoms, mostly cold symptoms, kind of coughs, thermal malaise. So We've been quite good. We still certainly uh, required uh, full PPE when taking care of those residents yeah. and, and uh, use of N95 masks on the unit. Um, <clears throat> and then we had a GI bug yeah, on, uh, yeah. on Stearns 1. So uh, we were restricted to admissions for a little bit, but this week we've been approved to, uh, to take, start taking admissions uh, on Stearns 1. And Stearns three once uh, uh, Stearns one once we continue the, the terminal cleaning. There are some benefits to this. Was my um, grandkids had the the tummy bug, and they had some plumbing issues, and I had to go in and just masked up, and you know, which you wouldn't have thought of two years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. went in and helped yeah. me son along with the plumbing, and uh, Good. survived it. Well, Ted's kept up with the letters to the families. That's been, I think, very well received. Uh, and I just really appreciate that you've done, you and the team, keeping up with family visits. Um, mm -hmm. I know a lot of that's in consultation with public health and or, you know, we've gotten more surgical with our ability to, you know, rather just do blanket lockdowns and nobody gets visits. And so I think that's been a really big, big positive thing that we've been able to keep doing. So. I haven't Good stuff. heard any complaints. People seem pretty happy of you guys, uh, you know, with visitation stuff we haven't had. Yeah. Uh, you know, I little, haven't heard any. Yeah, you know, a little concerns because, you know, for those that were on Stearns 2 and uh, <laughs> primarily, we've tried, to, we've tried to restrict some of the movements within the residents, uh, but, but that's that's going to free up here shortly. Yeah, I think they asked before. Residents must be all pretty much boosted by now. Most of them, uh, let's see, 89, 80, 90, 90% of residents are boosted. Yeah. And then the, um, the federal, the first de deadline for the federal vaccine mandate for staff. February 14th. Okay. Yeah. Where, are, where are we with, I know we had, we were just down to a couple that. Right, we have a total of five. Employees who have had not um, had any vaccination, so we've given them notice essentially that uh, effective February 14th, um, they'll be put on uh, a terminal leave and given a couple of weeks to decide whether or not they want to stay on board, take the. the uh, I think 
full time or per diem? Per diem. Okay. Or, or per diem is one housekeeper that's uh, that okay. full time with uh, commercial staff. So it's a small number, which is good, but we still take that, I guess, extra little bit of TLC to, to work with those folks. And maybe it's just a matter of parting ways, but I don't know. Yeah, one of them will be returning back to us. She decided uh, she'd be on maternity leave for shortly. Okay. And she kind of wanted to wait, wait for the vaccination. So that's, that's good. Yeah. Great. I can, I can understand that. <laughs> And then the Department of Corrections, you, you heard uh, Dave mention that they continue with testing. Uh, the numbers are pretty low. There are two uh, current staff in this uh, most recent round of positive tests and one inmate and all the other positives have recovered. So um, same deal, symptoms have been pretty minor. So that's, uh, that's good. So no real disruption to our operations and Hopefully, I guess, I don't know, we're on the back end of things, but if this is just another seasonal improvement <laughs> or a permanent one, I guess we're going to be soon. But. Well, yeah, I, well, there's, and you hear all the talking heads on TV, so you're not sure, but you know, there's have to be another variant coming down the road. And then one was talking about, just get used to it. It's going to be an every winter thing. All right. Um, well, perfect timing. I see Tim is has joined us, so we can skip back up to the public hearing, um, which should be in the binders. I'm not sure with the script. Is it clear who reads what? Or Tim, are you going to be able to guide us as to who reads what? Yeah, absolutely. Can everybody hear me okay? Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Good. Let me just reply to Sharon here. We have some of the people from RADC and RVCC in the Zoom waiting room. I'm just going to tell Sharon to go ahead and let them in if she's there. <laughs> let... Oh, thank you. <laughs> and then it'll also be Allison uh, there as well. Thank you, Sharon. Um, cool. All right. So I have a script here. Uh, you should, as the chair, should have a copy. There should be, it should be a highlighted version um and everything in yellow should be for the chair and there's a spot for the vice chair down there uh in green and uh anything not highlighted i will read so i was gonna say i didn't see any green but i gotta go deep into it yeah <laughs> can't go far enough <laughs> all right we open this public hearing to discuss a community development block grant CDBG project currently underway for the Micro Enterprise Center. Um, public hearings notice County of Sullivan Community Development Block Grants. The Sullivan County Commissioners will hold three public hearings on Monday, February 7th, 2022 at 3 p.m at the county offices at 14 Main Street, Newport, New Hampshire, first floor commissioner's conference room. The purpose of the first public hearing is to discuss and receive public comment on the micro enterprise projects currently underway. These projects are funded through a federal community block development block grant CDBG award to the county of Sullivan, awarded to the county of Sullivan. The second public hearing will discuss the application to the New Hampshire Community Development Finance Authority under the CDBG program. The CDBG funds are awarded on a competitive basis in New Hampshire and may be used for projects which have primary benefit to low and moderate income people. A municipality can apply for up to $500,000 in CDBG funds per year in each of the following categories, housing, public facilities, economic development, micro enterprise, technical assistance, and emergency funds. Municipalities can also apply for up to $25,000 annually for feasibility studies. The proposals to be considered by the commissioners are micro enterprise grants to be submitted by Sullivan County 
for up to $500,000. The funds less administrative costs will be subgranted to, to multiple entities, including the River Valley Community College, Rockingham Economic Development Center, and the New Hampshire Small Business Development Center for the purpose of providing training and technical assistance to micro enterprises. This public hearing has been scheduled to provide residents with specific information regarding the grant requirements. A third public hearing will be held to adopt the relocation and anti-displacement plan specific to these projects. Those interested are invited to attend and comment. Please contact the Sullivan County Commissioner's Office at 603-863-2560 or via Re Relay New Hampshire at 1-800-735-2964. In advance, if you have a disability or need assistance to attend or participate in the hearing, anyone wishing to submit written comments prior to the hearing should address them to the Sullivan County Commissioners, 14 Main Street, Newport Ange, 03773, or email manager at Sullivan County, New Hampshire Gill. I recognize Tim J Josephson to address the project. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Mr. Uh, Tim Josephson, and I'm an associate planner with the Upper Valley Lake Sunapee Regional Planning Commission. It is a requirement of the Community Development Block Grant Program, CDBG, to hold a public hearing while the project is underway to allow the public an opportunity to comment and ask questions. Today at this first hearing, we'll be providing an update on the 2021 microenterprise projects and accepting public comment and questions. Sullivan County has received $64,000 in CDBG microenterprise funds to support a microenterprise center at the River Valley Community College in Claremont and Lebanon, New Hampshire. Sullivan County is subgranting funds as follows, less administration costs. $54,000 to River Valley Community College in Claremont. The college's an entrepreneurship and innovation program will provide access for 20 low to moderate income micro entrepreneurs in Sullivan County and adjacent communities in Southern Grafton and Northern Cheshire County to its hands-on workshops, one-on-one -on -one coaching and in-depth programs. Specifically modeled after other successful micro entrepreneurial support programs in New Hampshire, this program offers two pathways, one designed for micro entrepreneurs in the startup phase of their business and the other for those in the early growth phase of their business. Both pathways combine one-on-one -on -one business coaching, training, and access for co-working makerspaces, providing a supportive incubator for these micro-entrepreneurs to start and grow their businesses. Through the first two quarters of the project, RVCC has served approximately two micro-enterprise business owners. The rollout did begin at the end of the fall in 2021. And of that $54,000, the University of New Hampshire, New Hampshire Small Business Development Center, SBDC, will provide business advising services for up to 20 low moderate income clients, qualifying for assistance through the CDBG micro grant at a rate of $1,500 per LMI client up to a maximum of $30,000. Uh, this project is scheduled to close out by June 30th, 2022. I open the floor to public comments and questions about the CDBG Microenterprise projects underway. Anybody have any comments? I now open the floor to staff and commissioners to comment. Any comments? So I'll just remark. So there's only been a couple so far. You know, we got a sixty-four thousand dollars grant. We only had two uh, people take up. Um, if you think of the what the Hannah Grimes Center does down in Keene. Um, that's kind of the vision for what this eventually will become, but because we really started it from, um, from square one, it's taken a little bit longer to maybe get going, but um, the good part is, and this was one of the questions that I had when we were planning for this is, are we gonna get dinged because it looks like we're not performing? You know, We got $64,000 and it's gonna take a while to spend it. This is not a typical kind of grant where it's the, the funds management is viewed that way. This is a drawdown. So we only take a drawdown when there's money that we need to spend because we've helped somebody. And so asking for the 500,000 is just providing that amount of money. 
Yeah. So we're not on the hook if we don't spend it, I guess is the good news. So okay. uh, as this program hopefully continues to grow and blossom, this just ensures that we'll have the resources approved to provide that support for these approved uh, micro entrepreneurs. So it's a good news story. It just provides that capacity and the funding uh, and the tools through the uh, folks at River Valley primarily to help get them connected and on their way. So yeah. um, well, it's a great, uh, great asset. It certainly is. Uh, seeing no other public input, I close the public hearing. All right. I open this public hearing to address proposed community development block grant CDBG applica applications for a micro enterprise center. I recognize Jim Josephson to address the grant request. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as required for these hearings, I will start by providing a brief overview of the community development block grant program CDBG and then provide a description of the applications in question. CDBG funds are available to municipalities and counties on a competitive basis for projects that primarily benefit low and moderate income persons. Sullivan County is eligible to receive up to $500,000 a year for each of the categories of public facilities, housing, economic development, micro, micro enterprise technical assistance, and emergency funds. Feasibility studies are available for up to $25,000. There is a handout there in your packet describing the CDBG eligible activities that include the area HUD income limits. Uh, the proposed micro enterprise project is for up to $500,000 to support uh, both the River Valley Community College and the Regional Economic Development Center uh, in Raymond, New Hampshire. The funding is used to provide training and technical assistance, and in some cases, micro loan servicing to low and moderate income micro entrepreneurs. If the proposed application is successful, the funds will be awarded to Sullivan County which will subgrant the funds less administration costs to the following uh, subrecipients. The pro uh, proposed microenterprise project is for up to 500,000 to support the four entities in New Hampshire, the River Valley Community College, RVCC, Claremont Makerspace, CMS in Claremont, New Hampshire, the Small Business Development Center, SBDC in Durham, New Hampshire, and the Regional Economic Development Center, REDC in Raymond, New Hampshire. The funding is used by each entity to provide training and technical assistance and, in some cases, low, micro loan servicing to low and moderate, in, micro, low and moderate income micro entrepreneurs. If the proposed applications are successful, the funds will be awarded to Sullivan County, which will subgrant the funds, less administration costs to the four subrecipients. RVCC is interested in continuing to be recipients of the micro enterprise funding in 2023 with the maximum total amount of $89,560, of which $74,400 will be for the program, $11,160 for grant administration, and $4,000 for a grant writing fee. I provide uh, a handout describing that project. The proposed activities meet the goals of supporting the development of a diversified economy and supporting educational and training facilities which upgrade the skills of local residents in Sullivan County's Housing and Community Development Plan adopted in March of 2021. In total, for this program year, RVCC anticipates serving uh, more, than the, more than the 20 microenterprises uh, that they currently do. Um, I am here with representatives, well, uh, Allison Chisholm is running late. I'm not sure where she is. She is from RVCC, so I will uh, answer any questions that you might have for her. Um, but perhaps first, we'll also deal with the other one. So uh, we're also here to present the proposed microenterprise project from the Regional Economic Development Center in Raymond. While this is a new program for Sullivan County, REDC has been working with Cheshire County since 2015. Currently, Cheshire County is administering 135,000 in CDBG funds with activities including one-on-one -on -one meetings with business advisors, training and reading financial statements, and assistance with brand development and marketing. REDC anticipates that 60 low to moderate income small business owners will make use of these resources. The amount for fiscal year 23 is expected to be about 329,000 with approximately 300,000 in direct client support, 25,000 in grant administration costs, and a $4,000 grant writing fee. I have other handouts detailing their program. A representative from REDC is also here to discuss the programs. The proposed activities meet the goals of supporting the development of a diversified economy and supporting educational and training facilities, which upgrade the skills of local residents in Sullivan County's Housing and Community Development Plan adopted in March of 2021.
And uh, uh, Laurel Adams is here from REDC, if you would like to recognize her, to uh, go ahead and describe their program. Hi, Laurel. Good afternoon, commissioners. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you, Tim, for the introduction. Um, we are, you know, find ourselves in the position of needing to switch counties for our grant administration kind of at the last minute here. So I apologize that you're just seeing me now for this. Um, our program has really grown over the years, and I was, I was thinking about that as we were listening, talking about River Valley. You know, when we started the program, we had 30 beneficiaries the first year back in 2014. And I expect we'll have probably 90 this year. So it really is exponential growth. It takes a long time though to build that program. It's, it doesn't happen overnight. And I had a very nice meeting with Allison and I think we can be really supportive and work together on the program as well as provide her with the loan support which is the new aspect of the program that we haven't seen before. Um, REDC runs about 15 million in alternative loan funds all over the state. Uh, we've begun doing quite a bit of work in Sullivan County and Cheshire County, covering for uh, Monadnock Economic Development, helping Hannah Grimes uh, by running their first RLF, and a new partnership with Capital Regional Development to provide microloans to Sullivan County. Uh, Sullivan County Store was our first project just recently, and um, we also just did a big $500,000 loan uh, with Eric Chinberg in Claremont to do some of the affordable housing redevelopment. So we're excited to be a part of the area and to get to help out. And you know, hope we will see much more of you and that you're able to support our proposal to join in the application with uh, Tim and Allison at River Valley. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Um, is that the uh, low income down by the common? No, it's not low income, that's all market. That's all market, right? That's all market right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm afraid, I, I think Allison is, is not able to make it. I'm not sure uh, what happened she had intended to, but uh, I checked in with her. I have not seen from her, but it is a continuation of the same program that we are already doing, um, that they're doing there. And, and they, are, they have a uh, very nice plan for, uh, and Allison and I have met and talked about how to uh, get the word out about the existing program. And um, I'm very thankful that Laurel is, is here with us because she's, you know, connecting REDC and Sullivan County is, I think, going to make some good partnerships. And uh, having, the, having REDC on hand to, to work with RVCC, there's a lot of R's and C's in this, but uh, it, it's a good thing. And, and uh, I, I really look forward to this partnership growing. So. Any comments, Joe? No, I'm all set. Thank you. It well explained. I recognize the representatives from River Valley Community College and the Regional Economic Development Center to further address the grant re request. Um, are they anything else? Yeah, okay. I open the floor to public comments and questions about the proposed microenterprise CDBG projects. I now open the floor to staff and commissioners for comment. I just uh, had, again, more discussion. Um, the first thing that struck me was that I thought it was kind of weird that we had the REDC and from Raymond coming to Sullivan County. I'm like, well, how does that work again? And, uh, and so how they started in Cheshire. Uh, Tim or Laurel, can you all want to just help explain to the commissioners how that relationship is going to work and then some of the benefits as was explained to me about why this is going to be a good thing uh, for helping stimulate some small business growth in the county sure I, i'll go first um so basically the overview is that each county can and can apply for up to, to five hundred thousand dollars in cdbg funding for each section so one of those sections is micro enterprise um, Cheshire County has done, been very successful with their micro enterprise program between Hannah Grimes, um, the Small Business Development Center, and then REDC. And so when um, Kevin Peterson at CDFA, uh, which is the state side that, that runs all this stuff, uh, all the grant administration, um, they were looking at all their numbers and they're like, it's not going to fit in Cheshire County anymore. They looked at neighboring Sullivan County and said, there's room because right now we only had the one um, micro enterprise grant through the River Valley. 
uh, that's going. So we had room in Cheshire, in, in Sullivan County, to adopt that from Cheshire. Um, so yeah, it does sound a little weird for them to be in Raymond and coming all the way over to Sullivan County. But as you've seen, they're a, they're a statewide organization um, investing across the state. And Sullivan County is an area that they've, you know, just started dipping their toe in the water, you know, and uh, I, I guess that might be a good way to put it. Um, and so it's, it's a good way for them to connect and provide that lending support um, to the RVCC program um, because they've already established those connections rather than RVCs have, RVCC having to go find other lenders and, and line those all up. Um, they can work with REDC there. Um, it'll also open up more avenues for REDC to do investing in uh, the county um, and just kind of introduce them to a lot more uh, things that happen in Sullivan County um, and, and get some more attention from the rest of the state, I guess. That might be one way to put it. Um, Laurel, any, what would you like to add? I'll just add that um, we've had we had the same conversation with Cheshire County for many years. Why are you here? <laughs> you know, you're way across the state. And really, I think, you know, it's a mechanism that CD, CDFA has done a good job working with um, your county and Cheshire County in particular to support this program. It's not, I guess, technically feasible to have every county run the microenterprise program because you would need a grant administrator specializing in multiple counties as we're spread all over the state. So I think for efficiency, which is nice to see in New Hampshire, we're not you know, working in our own silo. They've tried to develop just a, a couple of few counties that specialize in this. I just wanna add that I hope it's a benefit for Tim and his organization that if we come on, it's a little bit more administrative support for them because our program is larger and that you know helps give them a buffer as River Valley grows and it really, it, it pays for Tim's investment, his time in learning what is a complex program and a lot of reporting. Thank you, Laurel. I didn't even think of that, but that's that's for sure because uh, they'll be able to grow our development here at Upper Valley Lake Sunapee RPC and uh, allow us to administer more CDBG grants because once we do the micro enterprises, then um, we can start getting involved in some other ones too, so. We appreciate it. We'll take all the help we can get. Yeah. I, I hope that answers the questions there. I know I really like you said, I realize it's a little weird, but hey, you know what? We'll we'll take our partners and, and we'll we'll have fun and, and we'll do some good stuff. We'll do some good work for the people. So we don't look at support as being weird, so that sounds good to me. <laughs> All right. Okay. Seeing no other public input, I close the public hearing for the per proposed community development block grant application. May I have a motion on the CDBG grant applications? I move to approve the submittal of the applications and to authorize County Administrator Derek Furland and, or County Commission Chair George Hebert as authorized um, designees to sign and submit the CDBG application. And upon approval of the CDBG applications authorize the authorized designees to accept any documents which may be necessary to effectuate the CDBG contract. So moved. Favor? Aye, Ben Nelson. Aye, George Hewitt. Aye, Joe Osgood. I think Sharon didn't make that any dark again. No kidding, I was, I was trying to. <laughs> That's some tongue twisters in there. <laughs> you did good. I sure to use green font. Too, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. The one meeting I didn't bring my glasses to. <laughs> okay, I now open the third public hearing for discussion of the residential anti displacement and relocation assistance plan relative to the proposed micro enterprise applications. I recognize Jim, Tim Josephson to address this matter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If any displacement takes place as a result of the proposed CDBG project, the Uniform Relocation Act must be followed, which requires that any displaced household or business in a project using federal funds must be found comparable housing or commercial space in a comparable neighborhood at a comparable price. 
Under the certification section of the applications, the county will certify that the Residential Anti-Displacement and Relocation Assistance RARA, plan is in place. And in the event that it is discovered that this specific project does displace person or households, a displacement implementation plan must be submitted to CDFA prior to obligating or expending funds. At this time, displacement is not anticipated for this proposed project. I open the floor to public comments and questions about the residential anti-displacement and relocation assistance plan. I now open the floor to staff and commissioners for comment. Your comment? Okay. Seeing no other public input, I close the public hearing for the anti-displacement and relocation assistance plan. Now I have a motion to adopt the Residential Anti-Displacement and Relocation Assistance Plan. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye, Ben Nelson. Aye, George Heaver. Aye, Joe Osgood. All right. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much. And Thank we'll we'll so see much. you in a bit. Really Thank you. It. Have a great day. Thanks, Thanks for dropping in. I think I have. Okay, I've been authorized to sign this now, so I can sign this. I'll get the share afterwards. Did you have originals to sign too? Okay. Yeah. This is an original. I'm not having two of those to sign. Yeah, that's. We caught up on signing. Uh, I was going to say, what are these? We need a motion. We need to sign this one. Nope, because I think that motion included it authorizing did. you or me to, to sign as so either one of us is approved to okay. sign these documents. So whatever Sharon teed up to yeah, sign. Some chairs. Uh, there were some forms that were last minute sent by Tim uh, two authorizations to submit claims. Yeah. One on the old grant, one on the new grant. The code of ethics and the grievance uh, procedures. I've got the originals for that apparently. Not if you're getting two. I do have. Okay. I guess these must be extra. Huh? Yeah. They're just looking for your signature. Thanks, Sharon. I think these are extras because I had an enjoyed to at the same time. Okay, cool. Uh, this is Sharon again, and Allison Chisholm just joined, so I don't know if you had any questions for her. She's the one that runs that program on Urban Valley. Yeah. If you wanted to chat with her, if she's here, otherwise. Um, I'm going to ask uh, 
No, I'm good. I think I'm good. All right. Yeah, thanks, Sharon. I'll I'll chat with her and tell her we're good to go. So, good afternoon. This is uh, kind of a catch up report for December, um, six months into the fiscal year. Look at the first page. Um, we came in at 122.1 census versus a budget 136. Um, seeing various dynamics as we've seen throughout the year, Medicare census. <coughs> Uh, came in at 5.2 versus a budget of nine. The uh, average rate per day is very high, 6.30 versus budget of 5.75, but because uh, total daily census was less, came in at the primary at 59,000 negative variance. Uh, one thing just to point out too, is we continue to, to have greater amount of Medicare Advantage plans. So if you look on that last row, it says insurance, Managed care A, that was a positive variance of 15,000. That's a similar uh, level of service uh, than Medicare Part A, which is that it's managed through a private insurance company. So that helps kind of reduce that variance somewhat. Medicaid was a 50,000 negative variance. So all told, when you add in the Medicare Part B for both uh, Part B and managed. Medicare Part B came in at the total revenue variance of minus 87,000. You're finding more, more people that are on Medicare buying uh, Advantage plans? Yes. Yes. You know, that's certainly being promoted very extensively, and, and we're, we, we continue to see more people have that plan. Anecdotally, it's a good deal. I mean, I, I just went on it and it's way cheaper than it was when I did my parents. Good. Good. Yeah, I yeah. think that that's it. And it does cover certain additional benefits through that. And so uh, and there's so many different yeah. kinds of I mean, you can, you can look for hours to the right. different categories and different yeah. price ranges. Yeah. But I remember what I used to have to write for checks with both mom and dad supplemental ones. Yeah. It's way less than I had to pay, and the one I've got pays for more than managed it. Right. So it's, it's, uh, yeah, so there's, there's certainly reason for people to sign on to that. Yeah, yeah. yeah when you hear Joe Namath hucking it, you think it's too good to be true. But <laughs> it, uh, I don't want to hear him. Him and that ex comedian there. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Dynamite. <laughs> JJ? Yes. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh my gosh. Oh, he's, he's, he's a senior citizen now, believe it or not. So then if you look at the next page, uh, revenue um, year to date through December 21, they're showing uh, as we've been seeing the Medicaid is the primary variance, 416,000, uh, along with Part B and Part A. Um, so there have been on the bottom, there have been a couple of additional payments, Medicaid growth payment payout, but that's, that's related to the enhanced FMAP of the uh, increase of 6.5% versus the 50-50 federal state program. So um, those are those, those dollars that are reflected from there. What this doesn't show 
is what we, and it'll show in January's report this month, is we received $300,000 from the state gopher, um, some additional yeah. uh, ARPA funds that the nursing homes were able to apply for. So that came in in January, along with uh, another 31,000 of uh, the enhanced death map. One of, those, one of those programs that I had. Uh, don't know. Don't ever know. Don't know. Um, I mean, they've yeah. been really great to have access to. It. They really have. Yeah. yeah. The, the aspect of, and especially the gopher program, that, that they may have an impact or will have an impact on, um, because those are essentially Medicaid kind of dollars mm -hmm. on, on our calculation of the pro share at the end of the year. Yeah. Oh, so it's going to eat into brochure. Yeah, we need to into that. There is a there is a catch. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that three hundred thousand will eat into this five hundred and six thousand. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's the essence of that. Right. Well, yeah, the net is net negative seven twenty four, but three hundred. Right. Yeah. So it'll be like four hundred something, right, Ted? Right. So that was uh, the issue about Gopher and ARPA that was brought up last week, actually, at the Ways and Means Committee, uh, at the work session that I was at. So the, the chair of that committee was openly musing that he didn't understand how the state's ARPA money is being spent, who's in charge of it. So this is, I wouldn't say it's a black box, but it's just information that's not super easy to find. They did say, though, during the hearing that uh, just like we got half and half well, we get the first half, we haven't had the second half yet. The state's the same way. They got 490 odd million yeah. and 410 of that has been allocated. So there's still about 80 million out there. And then of course, they'll get their second tranche of 490 this spring when we get our second half. Why don't they just dump some of that into the nursing home building fund? <laughs> well, they, they would if that bill is gonna pass, but that bill's gonna get killed. So they, <laughs> but they, there's other ways that maybe we can still access that. Anyway, the, the point is, is so who's in charge of allocating that, that last 80 million and the next 490? No one really knows. Okay. Like Gophers involved somehow, but we don't really know how. It's just it is what it is. But yeah, well, but well, they did open up this program for us. And again, that was a, a bit of a weird process because we didn't hear about it till the day that the deadline. So I, I heard about it at an NHAC meeting and I furiously <laughs> contacted Ted and Lewis and I said, Did you guys know about this gopher? And it just was not very widely yeah. disseminated. So they extended the deadline graciously so that we could apply. So that's a three hundred thousand dollar like oops. I mean that would be yeah. that's real money. I mean, that's real money. Lord, it was uh, yeah. Especially was when your when your budget is at yeah, you know, teetering, you're really close anyway. Right? And some counties were like, oh yeah, we heard about it a couple weeks ago. And I'm like, uh, yeah. Anyway, it was astonishing. So it pays to go to the draw meetings. Yeah. Yeah, well, this was a Zoom meeting, but yeah, that was a three hundred thousand dollar meeting. Even right? better. Um, then if you look at census, we've been running certainly candidates about one hundred fifteen. Uh, we continue to see a kind of inclusion census, slow but sure. The actual census in January came in at uh, one twenty four with eleven skills. Uh, even though the last couple of weeks the census has dipped a little bit, the Medicare census, because um, of our patients that are on COVID, who can access Medicare, there's a, a three-day waiver, hospital waiver, is still in place for being able to put people back on Medicare Part A if uh, they have a COVID diagnosis. So we're able to access uh, for several patients mm -hmm. with that. Now, I mean, you got to think there's a huge backlog of people that are staying at home as long as they can because of COVID. I mean, are you, I mean that's what I assume. Is that the case? Or? I, I think we're starting to see, certainly, as, as we know, the hospitals are full. Um, yeah. You know, much of that is due to COVID, but much of the other part of that is to patients who may be deferred services or needed services, you know, during COVID. Um, and eating them now. So, yeah. uh, I, and we're, we're certainly, I think we're going to continue to see some, uh, some ability to increase census. 
Um, Derek asked Dave about how staff burn out and how do, do we have enough staff? We, more we do. Start we, we do have enough staff. We're certainly using um, what what we feel is more more agency use than we'd like, uh, but we actually have been able to decrease that over the last two months. But, uh, it's a fascinating article about traveling nurses in the Valley News you know, a couple of days ago. And it, Almost sound like some were leaving Hospital A to travel to Hospital B, and some regulars from Hospital B were ended up in Hospital A as travelers. Yeah, pretty well, because they're paying huge dollars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the emissions you see that were alluded to with the month of December, we had 15 emissions and five discharges. This year, we had uh, 66 emissions and 44 discharges. So Could that program that the state approved to help provide that interim funding, you know, when there's that sort of weird time in the resident status, right? Is that it's still on board? Uh, there again, we've had a couple of weeks kind of pausing admissions, but mm -hmm. uh. Uh, for that program, we've admitted uh, three, I believe, under that program, oh, okay. where, um, where we um, are allowed to, what that program is, allows for us to accept the patient under Medicaid pending without the approval of Medicaid, mm -hmm. and, and allows certainly the hospitals to be able to discharge the nursing facilities for those that are eligible. But it's still kind of waiting on the application process. Mm -hmm. well, uh, so we've done that program. And, and, and open personal experience, that can be an interesting transition. It sure is. Yeah. Uh, our population isn't getting any younger. So yeah. I can't imagine things going to slow down for a while. Actually, I hope that there's more and more people here now. So. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I'll do it again in a couple weeks. Yeah, that's good. Thank you, Ted. Yeah. Keeping your head above water. Thank you, Ted. Yeah. I'm sorry we're going to lose it. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm going to be the whole. I'll second that. A little closer like the end, maybe? Yes, actually. Yeah. There are lots of fun, and I'm sure your uh, daughter will be glad to have the help. Right. Around here, when someone says they're going to Pittsburgh, that usually has an entirely <laughs> different connotation. <laughs> Got a steam trailer behind the pickup truck. Right. <laughs> In Ted's case, it's the three rivers. Yeah, <laughs> three rivers. And it's half a star wearing in yellow and black. I don't know if that's very <laughs> cute. <laughs> That'd be the hardest thing to do. All right. Well, yeah. Dad, Mary, you're up. Okay. So uh, for January's report, um, rolling over from uh, last month, just to hit some of the highlights on this, uh, we also had a staff change in the facilities department. Steve Arsenault, who is the assistant director, um, before this report had announced his intent to retire since then, there's been enough time that he actually has, ret has retired. He had been yes, in the county yeah, the whole for uh, more than 12 years. And yeah. so he um, took a, he uh, retired and took a um, different position that was a little bit less challenging and closer to home, which worked out with his um, plans, for, plans for retirement. So we certainly wish him well. And um, and we're able to send him off um, positively. So since then, um, a group of us interviewed several candidates last week, and we have um, we have the next round of uh, interviews coming up this week. So we are 
excited about uh, some of the people that we talked to. So, um, we uh, installed three new washing machines that the nursing home purchased uh, to replace the three worst, uh, most troublesome units that we had down at the jail. Uh, the root cellar vermiculite project has been completed. Uh, we just got the clearance report from that today, which wraps up um, everything associated with taking uh, access back to the root cellar. And so once the payment clears will be the last piece of information that I need to submit um, a application to the uh, trust that has been established to help uh, reimburse home and business owners um, of the Zonalite um, attic insulation. So uh, Zonalite brand represented about 75% of the vermiculite that was used. Um, and so we have a sample that was gathered by our environmental consultant that we send in with our application and they test it and determine if it was in fact uh, from the particular mine that Zonalite got their vermiculite from. And if so, we would be uh, reimbursed about $4,300. So that certainly will help um, uh, help with that if we are in fact uh, covered by that particular trust fund. Um, Is that put into a trust because of the lawsuit? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the, if you remember back in September, I applied for a grant from the Drinking Water Trust Fund uh, to potentially fund um, new uh, drinking water storage tank buildings. Uh, you know that we, um, there's some attention that needs to happen to those in the next few years here. And actually I looked at some even potential options of um, reducing the, I guess, in environmental susceptibility of our current buildings uh, by replacing them with enclosed tank and potentially moving that tank closer to the uh, second New Hampshire Turnpike for access. And so I had come up with a couple of different alternatives. So we were notified that we were not selected for that grant. Mm -hmm. um, the trust fund grant prioritizes projects that, that address contamination or are ready for construction. So basically further down the line. And they also prioritize projects that exhaust all other funding sources. And they also prioritize a loan over a grant. So uh, the, I gave uh, DES a call to find out um, if there was anything that they recommended. They recommended applying for the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund, which calls for a pre-application um, in the spring. So I will, and that's awarded more as a loan with principal forgiveness. So um, a little bit different than a grant, but also the potential to, um, you know, have some of our principal um, negated. So I will be watching for those application deadlines. Um, they did say that uh, the state revolving fund is a way that they were um, distributing additional ARPA funds that DES had, had been awarded. So. Mary, do we need any kind of preliminary study to at least narrow down what our design solution and maybe do some preliminary engineering? Yeah, so when I prepared the grant last fall, I had several conversations with Tim Knapp from the Dufresne Group that did our asset management plan. And he actually helped me come up with the cost estimates for the different options that we looked at. Okay. Um, and so I think that's that's the next step um, is I think to see, to see, I would say to see where an application gets us on the uh, approved of the pre-application list. And if we don't make any headway on that this year, I think we probably would benefit from doing a study. Okay. Um, in the whole scheme of things, in order to do a design, we would study a little bit further. It's a question of if we want to do that first or not. Yeah. Um, but I would do a little bit more digging to see where the project right now would get us on sort of a priority list. Um, but we can talk further. Okay. Further about that. Um, I believe June is when um, is when this next application comes up. So we have a little bit of time. So when you say doing some digging, you mean figuratively speaking? Yes. Because okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking the two solutions that pop in my head, either it's a 
traditional water tower, yeah. a metal tank, you know, high in the air, yeah. mm -hmm. or you do a, you know, you dig a big concrete box and you cover it, not with a <laughs> building that, you know, they have to worry about pest yeah. infiltration. It's just, you know, yeah. a safe way to do one or the other. Well, Maybe there are other solutions, but. At least you could do the metal tank. You wouldn't have to, with that hill, it wouldn't have to go in the air. You just basically sit on the ground. Yeah. Um, it seems like this would fit the infrastructure plan too. I don't know how There's money. So much from, money flowing around. Yeah. Water. Yeah. Yeah. And, this is an yeah. and so that's what. So, so my understanding is not only art, but is any funds that come to the state that are distri distributed for infrastructure type plans would be routed through these programs okay. uh -huh. rather than DES so starting we don't, have to go out, we don't have to go out and look for them. Right. Okay. Um, the only other thing that we would want to be aware of is if there's any opportunities outside DES to apply for infrastructure money. Yeah. If we can um, access any other money outside of the state programs through an infrastructure bill or things like that. So we still got the year of um, Gene Shaheen's. Um, yeah, I mean, work, we'll on, the other, to work on the other thing first. Yeah. Uh, so you don't think we need to be closer to shovel ready? I guess that, uh, that was my point. You're going from like narrowing down possible options to, hey, this is what we want to do. This is where we want to do it. Just send money. I don't know if it'll, it'll get to that point. Um, I, can, I can talk to Tim a little bit more and see what he thinks. I haven't gotten back to him to let him know okay. that we didn't work selected for a grant um and then um see what he thinks i mean it might it might be worthwhile to at least get some preliminary engineering work done sure to come up with uh i guess more definition of the options yeah um and maybe a, a recommendation on on what okay. we look at doing okay I, I can't remember what was the out of pocket cost if we don't get funding for that um, well, the three the, the three options ended up anywhere being from a couple hundred thousand to a couple million. Yeah, I, I remember Yeah, because what we've been carrying on the CIP, which I'm updating for this year, was just to replace the roofs. Um, but we actually have quite a bit more infiltration into those buildings that I think we need to look at doing the roofs and siding. Um, just sort of a full envelope to keep wildlife out. Oh, <laughs> and yeah, and the other thing too is the um, the access road. We access those either from um, the employee parking lot at the North Nursing Home or up above at the Fire Pond, and that road is really not much more than an ATV path. In fact, it it encompasses some of Lionel's hiking trail. And so um, we need to keep that open in the winter in order the emergency plan calls for water to, to be introduced in the system through those tanks. And it's very, it's a very difficult endeavor to keep those roads open. Um, so part of the proposed plan was also to build a proper road to get into that area or alternatively move that tank closer to the access road up near the, the up, move it up closer to the fire pond area. Yeah, that would make lots of sense. I mean, that would make lots of sense. I was gonna say, if we do end up using things, is there some way you could just cover those tanks, you know, put a cover right on the cement tanks rather than, yeah, having, the, rather than have a building around them? Um, to me, that would almost seem to be the easier. How many, how many gallons? I think they're like 100,000 gallons each. Yeah, it's a big, yeah, big box. Yeah, yeah the box is there. Like the you just need a roof on it. Yeah, yeah. The, the box is there and recoded, and I mean yeah. the tanks are not in bad shape. Right? Yeah, we we inspect the tanks every three years, and so that we are due for that again this year, I believe. We just and had them painted or epoxied or something. Too. Yeah, um, there's never been. This will be the third time we've inspected them while I'm here, and there's never been. There's never mm -hmm. been anything of issue with the tanks themselves. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to some way you just put some precast over the top, or yeah. then again, you have some road work to get there. Yeah. Yeah, they're not in a great location. I mean, up there, yeah. which is good for her. Yeah. Her, her but I mean, the easy yeah. thing uh, with the, like a steel tank closer to the road would make all kinds of sense. Yeah. 
in. So um, we're worth to do on that, but unfortunately they just didn't hand us money. So <laughs> we'll continue, we'll continue to, to work on that. Um, so we had had on, and it's still on as a separate uh, line item, was to award uh, the consulting services for copy of printer procurement. Um, this ended up under the threshold of $5,000. So Derek and I went ahead and awarded it to um, SPC. Um, specialized purchasing consultants, they're out of uh, Dumner. And so we made contact with them and I uh, believe Sarah Moonyard has a meeting set up to come in and evaluate our current equipment um, next week. And then uh, Alex will help start the procurement process for renegotiating our public contracts and hopefully save us some money. Let's see. God, that's a cheap copy, but it's just to help us find the copy. Yeah. Yes, so, and in, in general, he should save us more money than, than, than what we pay in, so. Um, so the last thing I have on there is a sole source request for um, the DOC HVAC control system. Um, so in, uh, if you recall, we have uh, $60,000 approved in the FY22 budget. This was an item that has been deferred for a couple of years, hoping to uh, time it at the same time that we were um, awarding and doing uh, construction on the nursing home to uh, choose uh, the same type of systems in order to leverage um, sharing equipment and sharing parts and, and whatnot. And so as that project has been delayed, uh, we have developed a real sense of urgency with some existing issues that we have in um, in the jail. So, so as an explanation for sole source is uh, when we think so. Currently, if there's a Johnson control system in there, and there's really only two players out there for control systems of this size, uh, so it's really choosing one between choosing one or the other. Um, the nursing home also has a small system controlled by Johnson Controls. And um, as we looked to take a look at either bidding this out and really making a holistic change or determining what was exactly, what exactly needed to be upgraded as well as determining what our current um, repair issues are, we discovered a few things is that um, the, uh, there's three parts of the system is that there's the supervisory controller, there's a server, and then there's wiring. Well, I guess there's four parts. There's communication wiring from the controller and all the individual sensors out on all the um, actual uh, VAD boxes or dampers. Mm -hmm. And so one thing that we did not account for was that the wiring between the controller and the VAD boxes uh, would be an issue. And so what we have learned in trying to solve some of the current problems that we're having with the HVAC controls at the DOC is Control Tech who designed and installed the system back when the jail construction hat or the community Corrections Center was constructed was that um, the way that they have wired the system when there's a fault at a sensor at a VAB box, it creates a dead short in the system. And um, so that design of wiring is outdated when it comes to how new systems work. And it also prevents us from just being able to uh, change out a sensor and get it working again. So, um, so there's a piece that wasn't part of sort of that ballpark that we thought the $60,000 would take care of. Then the second piece of that was when I mentioned uh, that we had deferred it a couple of years to hopefully catch up with the timing of the nursing home project is uh, 
the server allows us to have access to the HVAC uh, program outside of the jail itself. And it would also create one campus-wide uh, control system for both the nursing home and the jail. And so that is something that the nursing home project would need to do regardless. So we were hoping to time it right and be able to get you know, two systems for the price of one, so to speak. And so when we think about now that we have to replace the control wiring and then um, at, at some point, whether the nursing home project moves forward sooner or later, we would need to install a new server. Um, it raises it raises the price of things. So what we had so a couple of things have happened is the the scope has grown and the timing is off. And so if you look at the sole source request that I have on the second page, it sort of lays out the three phases that we would look at doing. And so phase one is what I'm proposing that we move forward with now with Johnson Controls, and that upgrades the supervisory controller and replaces all the communication wiring to the existing field devices. Um, it addresses operation concerns that we have now that need immediate attention and upgrades the main hardware and software that's beyond repair and replacement. And so this gets us the bare minimum that we need to upgrade the system and keep moving forward. And so that's um, estimated at $53,000. So that is within the $60,000 that we have um, planned. So if you look at what phase two and phase three that we don't have money approved for, but would either be coming through a nursing home, phase two could come through the nursing home project or phase two and phase three, we would propose in this budget preparation, uh, which gives you a little um, preview of, of that conversation is phase two is to install a new server and, front, and provide um, a front end to provide more modern and better control of the HVAC and create a, a unified system across the campus. Um, that is about $60,000. Again, that's something that, that would need to be required with the nursing home project, but we only need to do it one time between the two projects. So if we were to do it this next budget year as part of a jail project, it's like deducting $60,000 out of the nursing home project. We only need to do it one time. Um, so I'm not requesting that money right now, but phase three is each is upgrading the 40 plus or minus field controllers um, that are at the individual control points within the DOC. Um, some controllers may not be up, need to be upgraded based on the type of controller that they are, but that we won't know until we replace all the communication wiring. So if we were in phase three, we need to upgrade the 40 plus or minus, that would be about just over $30,000. Um, so that just gives you an idea of what we're looking at going forward. But again, the base kind of minimum that we need to have an upgraded system falls within what we have budgeted for this year. And so to back up the um, sole source request a little bit more because this is a large amount to ask for a sole source request is um, um, a couple of things is that uh, we already do have a presence with Johnson Controls on the Unity campus. Um, a large number of field devices could possibly be maintained um, in phase three. However, if we switch to another vendor, they would all need to be replaced. Um, and the current system is, is operating in a very fragile state. Any significant power outage could impact our ability to reload the program, requiring facility staff to man the system 24 seven and manually and open. Um, open and control uh, valves and other dampers to maintain heating or cooling in spaces as well as uh, several devices are currently inoperable because they have the dead short mentioned previously. Um, so in order to just address our immediate problem and um, fix it but not upgrade it, we're in the 12 to $15,000 range, which would be um, throwaway money if we were to switch to another vendor. Um, would take a long, which would take a longer time to procure and solicit proposals for. 
And like you said earlier, in my experience, there's really only Johnson Controls in, in Honeywell, basically. And typically on larger projects, what I've seen is, is the money comes in pretty identical and you make a choice based on personal, personal preference for the project, um, features that they might offer, or the schedule that they can. So it's usually based on non-monetary uh, pluses and minuses. So um, moving forward with this proposal from Johnson's Control, it upgrades the guts of the system that we need and sets us up to for further improvements um, in the years to follow, whether it be as part of the nursing home project or continuing on its own path if the nursing project doesn't move forward. Old, old so it was done um, when the community correction center was done. So it was that 2010. Um, and so part of the issue um, is that my understanding is that it was used through, it was designed and built by a company called Contratac, which installed Johnson control systems. And um, the individual that owned it really designed the control systems with a little bit different philosophy than anybody else. And there were positive reasons to do that at the time. However, the direction that these DDC systems have gone in have added different features, which their wire, that type of wiring doesn't support. Um, and so that's part of our inability to upgrade. And then the secondary piece where that design, when it fails, it creates a dead short. And so um, not to say that that was wrong at the time, it just, it, it was just different than, than how, things are, how things are going. So one of the other things was, and I'm not sure how much of that is related to the fact that, um, Johnson Controls hasn't been able to support up software upgrades since before I came. Um, so we haven't been able to update the Metasys software for, for more than five years because it was no longer supported either because of the hardware or the software. Um, and so we've sort of been in this pattern where we've been evaluating what we think our real liability and risk is and so that's why this year and this year's budget, um, I was a bit more forceful to say, we can't wait for the nursing home anymore. We need to move forward. And then um, just over the past couple months, more things are coming to light as we dug into it a little bit further. And it all runs off of one exterior unit or is there more than one? Um, is that a roof mount? It's, just... it's actually mounted, it's inside. It is inside. Yeah, there's a, we have, well, there's a, boiler room which is the backup boilers but then there's another room that has the full hvac unit in it yeah and, and you're happy with the service availability with johnson and uh, yeah it's it's one of those things that you could pick either one of the vendors and have okay. it's a love-hate relationship that just don't want to put a band-aid on it no i mean yeah. no yeah, and what i do the stages fix it all Oh yeah, and so that's what um, so that's what we've been working through over the last month is to understand exactly how to do this in a logical way. Um, and so we're really happy with the way that they've broken out the phases. Uh, one, because it matches sort of the amount of money that we currently have approved and it addresses our biggest issue right now. And so it gets us, this phase gets us the majority of the way there. And then, and then um, it gives us some time to one, get into that next budget cycle to request um, the server piece, which we know we would have to buy as part of any renovation. Um, in fact, that once we get that server, they can hook up our existing Johnson control system in the nursing home. So we would actually have improved control of that um, sooner than later as well too. So I'm really happy because that's what I was, I was really concerned with how um, we could break it up 
and not negatively impact or not spend money in the wrong direction versus doing it all at one time. Um, and so that balances the fact that due to the current um, urgent issues that we have right now, like we cannot wait until July 1st to do these things. So how many zones is it running? Um, a lot in the building there, so. um, yeah, I don't know how many zones um, mm -hmm. it is, but typically if we think about 40 sensors, that's probably 40 mm -hmm. DAV boxes. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. each one of those has their own control. So yeah, that's crazy. They don't even use that system anymore. Yeah. A lot of them have been gone with you know, yeah. uh, the wireless. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So Mary, Mary, when you say campus-wide uh, ability to control the, the whole campus, does that also mean that you'll be able to control it from off-site somewhere through a computer? Um, yes. Once once we did, if we did um, phase two, which installs the server, I could actually um, pick up my cell phone and. Uh, Change the temperature in Dave's office if I wanted to on my cell phone. So put somebody in China. Well, which is I can. So I can also that see that. I can also see that saving maybe a call out at some point. Somebody calls yeah. in with a problem, you might be able to handle it right. Okay, that sounds good. You can have if your Wi-Fi savvy. You can make <laughs> that stuff work. <laughs> yeah. So can the little guy. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Not that I want to uh, outsource, not that I want to eliminate my job, but Joe, you could probably even do it from Florida. <laughs> oh, that sounds good. Yeah. I don't need heat right now. <laughs> 77 <laughs> degrees right now. We didn't need to hear that, Joe. Yeah. Well, last week you needed it, though, right? It's probably a good thing. Uh, yeah, it was chilly down here. It got down into the 50s. Um, in accordance with paragraph. 2.12 of the procurement and vendor management policy to authorize, I move to authorize the director of facilities and operations to contract with Johnson Controls Incorporated of Milwaukee, Wisconsin for 52,954 and 44 cents for their February 7th, 2022 dated proposal as presented today and for expense and for the expenditure to be charged to line 10481-21097. I'll second it. All in favor? Hi, Ben Nelson. Hi, right. George Ebert. Hi, Joe Osgood. Thank you very much. I was oh, really nice. tempted to round that down, but <laughs> you <laughs> could knock off the 44 cents. <laughs> Yeah, it was um, to me it was a number that big to throw in. <laughs> you mentioned CIP. Are we going to do that at the next commissioner's meeting, or do we need a separate time prior to focus on that? Um, I think you and I are scheduled to meet on Friday, and I think that was part of what we talked about to okay. figure out the amount of time that we needed and if yeah. that was going to be able to be in a commissioner's meeting or if we wanted to set up something. You just spent about 20 okay. minutes on I think HVAC control. <laughs> while we've got them here, yeah. maybe an hour. Yeah. So just if, if meeting an hour early at the next commissioner's meeting to just focus on CIP sure. stuff, if that would be okay. As a precursor, before we get into the budget, we'll talk CIP during the budget process, but that'll also be with the EFC. Yeah. So I'd like to you know, talk about these things with you before we get into that yeah, forum. So, okay. So we'll plan on adjusting. I'll get with Sharon and make sure the time is noticed correctly. And then, okay. okay and then let's see, we changed today on that too, then we did. Uh, we did. Yeah. Um, I wasn't, I was wondering, I had looked at the calendar to realize. Is this a 28th? Sounds right. Because we pushed it a week, right? Yeah, I think yeah. we did. Yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll verify that, but I'll, and we'll make sure to get one yeah. of you. Okay. I, I may be gone on the 28th. So. Uh, this is Sharon, and it's Tuesday. Oh. oh. The 22nd. Okay. Okay. So. okay. I think we all would have been showing up on the wrong day. I, 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 I knew we changed it. All right. Thank you, Sharon, for that. Oh, okay. Yeah, so tentatively, we'll, we'll we'll set that up. Really, really gone over the CIP control. 
Well, that's, that's why we want to yeah. take a little bit of time to just talk about it because it has been a while. I mean, everything is still pretty well been wrapped up into the nursing home yeah. project, but I think there are some other things that we mm -hmm. want to get your two cents on. Yeah, I, there's probably quite a bit that we want mm -hmm. to you know, really approach. We've been putting stuff off for a couple of years now. The commissioners need new office. We lost our last one. That's working out okay. Yep, so far so good. We can get you an office for $57 million. I bet you could. <laughs> <laughs> There's plenty of room. All right. Uh, oh, we're up to my second half of my report. Okay, so in section eight of your binders, uh, the first memo is just for your information only. Just shows you what was sent to all the department heads who formally kicked off our FY23 budget build. And so uh, from the middle of March, um, I'll be meeting with the department heads and um, take a couple of weeks. A consumer price index of 5.9%. It's been a long time since I've seen a number like that. Um, so along with that is uh, the, the long skinny handout with yellow Highlights is this the oh draft time timeline. Already. This is a product we've seen before. Um, we use the same template every year. So again, all the dates are tentative, but just kind of outlines. But last year we actually were about a month or six weeks behind with uh, just everything going on. So this kind of gets us back to our more traditional schedule of the month of April. Um, and I have not reached out to Representative Gottling to see which days of the week are better for them. I know sometimes it's Mondays and Fridays are best because they're in Concord, yeah. but I don't, I think that's even probably different than in years past. Yeah. So we still need to confirm that, but, yeah. but the month of April will be the heavy lifting. Yeah, okay. um, that leaves pretty much the month of May for any catch up work that needs to get done since the public hearing still will be that second ish week of June and the convention right at the end of June, so. Um, that will be an interesting budget. Right? Yeah, we're uh, within the departments, we're you know, in addition to just reviewing and building our department budgets, we do have that added um, initiative where we're talking about the, the wage information and what we're going to see what we're going to get from Grafton County's wage survey. Um, some other county just completed one. I can't remember if it was Cheshire or Rockingham. Again, I don't know how relevant it is, but it's another data point that we can we can factor into. Are they just doing it countywide to compare their wages versus what's going on in the county? Is that what it's yeah. all about? Couple of different counties that actually hired the same company to do to do theirs. It's just a matter of how much geography, you know, comes into play before it's completely irrelevant. You know, it's hard for us to compare if it's not Cheshire and Grafton. Yeah. Um, it doesn't really seem like it's, you know, a suitable comp. But, but again, it's it's a data point. You just got to take it with a grain of salt if it's yeah. uh, far enough away. But um, I wonder if that takes into account. Uh, and employees, you know, the lack of or the, you know, the, the supply as well as the data from wages. Yeah. If that all gets thrown in the mix. That'll be interesting to see. That's a good, that's a good, I mean, yes, supply and demand, theoretically, if you raise the wages, you get no trouble hiring people. But I think at some point, there's just not enough people. <laughs> and that's no what I'm wondering. It, but it, um, it, it, no matter what they seem to find, if, it, if they're still not finding people to work. So, uh, any, any questions on the notional schedule? Actually, Commissioner Osgood, where, where do you plan on being back? You're on mute. Yeah. You must be muted. Yeah. Mr. Osgood, you're muted. I was muted. I'm sorry. Sometime in April. Oh, sometime in April. Okay. Okay. We're supposed to hit 70 in April up here. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> it'll be it'll be so hot here when I get back there. It's gonna feel like it's cold out. <laughs> um, all right. Any any other any questions at all? Um, okay. Um, next up are January financials. Um, good news is January was a lot like the month before. Um, our, our overall relative position on a fiscal year didn't change much. Um, revenues are still looking pretty good. Although I did notice in looking at this month that we have not been receiving the uh, revenue from the state for the quarterly. So I got to follow up with them and see why, um, where that's been. So um, on the expenses, uh, we're still in that about 5% range for being under our expense budget. So that's a that's a really good spot to be. I was really worried. Three. So I know there are still some rather big numbers that are infrequent bills that are paid. And sometimes it's it's hard for me to know if it's a quarterly thing. Okay, did it not clear yet? And that could make a couple of tenths of a percent of a difference just alone with um, some of the payments through the nursing home. But I think by and large, we're still going to be in, in decent shape to be in that, I'd say maybe three or four percent under under budget, somewhere in there. So because of that, I didn't really you know, feel the need to drill down too deeply by department, but overall it's pretty solid. Um, nursing home renovation project update. I don't know, Mary or Ted, unless you have anything new. Um, so I guess the working group is probably worth mentioning on the, the, the date that was picked is uh, Monday, which the county is off from. I had planned on being out of town that weekend. Yeah, I didn't bring it up because I just didn't think it was appropriate since I'm not actually a member of the committee, but I'm also not naive either. I know we provide a lot of input to the committee. Yeah. I thought it would just be a matter of coordinating ahead of time. We could meet with you one-on-one. -on -one. We could meet with Representative Sullivan one-on-one. -on -one. I know he already asked to do that. So I just wanted to let you know that, that was- Yeah, I don't think I don't think either one of you guys should take a vacation day off to come here. For that, for that committee. Well, normally I wouldn't care. If I didn't have plans, I wouldn't mind coming in. I mean, if, you, always... if you've got, you know, like, a, yeah, I think that's a good idea. If you've got information that, that was brought up in the last meeting that they're looking for this time, just give it to me and I can do it. Right. And we'll work on the, you know, the building access. You, you've got the key, right? So, yeah. And then getting in here as well to unlock. I think this, we, yeah. This is usually never locked. No, this one is. It is. I yep. come through all the time in the morning. It's fun a lot. Because uh, Matt unlocks it first oh, thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, this is Sharon. I'll make sure to give him a key. Okay. But anyway, I just wanted to bring it up. Like I said, I didn't bring it up because number one, my plans weren't finalized and I just didn't think it was appropriate to be the one feeling I was dictating the terms to the working group when I'm not on the working group. <laughs> so anyway. No, we're, you know, we, we set that meeting up. It's not. It was my idea to take a take a holiday off and come in here, but and then uh, the last item, the ARPA update. Um, I also, and I don't know if it'd be appropriate to do this. We could possibly combine it with our CIP session. Is knowing that there's a possibility of of getting significant aid from the state. You know, the bill HB 1525 is going to die, but Representative Aaron is still working um, hard to try to get a pretty big number from the state. If that happens, I just I just wanted to do some brainstorming with, with you all. Um, I think that would open up the possibility of not deploying every nickel of our remaining ARPA money for the nursing home project. And maybe it would be appropriate to consider some other uses that would really have some long-term benefit for uh, the county. So I'd like to explore some of those options with you and just see what you think and keep that in our hip pocket. I do think um, before the budget build, it might not hurt to sit down with the EFC and discuss this as well, provided that all these ideas meet, you know, uh, meet muster with you. Um, that might be the next step, but let's just take one step at a time. The first one is just to, to do uh, a quasi brainstorming session to uh, take your temperature on some other possible uses should a uh, 
Uh, the, the thing that's drawing me here is that that renovation was turned down. Take the ARPA money right out of the picture. The renovation was turned down when it was cheaper to build it without ARPA money than it is now. They will and, say they never and, turned it down. And now, now, even with the ARPA money, we're looking at a huge, you know, a significant increase over what it was before the ARPA money. So I'm really curious to see what what comes out of this, really, I, I, to see how they, what their thought of, their thought process is at, at this point. I know the numbers, but you know they're going to be high. They're going to be, at, you know, astronomical mm -hmm. tax wise. Tax increases would be the, the big hit. Yep. Um, and it wouldn't matter. Back then, two years ago, it didn't matter which side was in control. It got shot down. So it, it, it's just, uh, I'll be curious to see what how they think. Another reason to start asking these questions and developing some of the uh, contingency plans for the ARPA is, you know, I hate to say it, but what if yeah. the reality of the nursing home is so expensive that we decide to not go forward with it? Yeah. Well, we're still going to have all this ARPA money. We should do something with it. It'd be foolish to just, you know, give it back. We could really put it to good use. So um, I still think, uh, obviously, the lion's share, if not every penny of it, should go towards the nursing home project. But again, if the state aid is as generous as we'd like it to be. And uh, well, that's probably a slim probability of that actually happening. Um, you know, just widening the aperture a little bit just to think about some other possible uses of those funds. That would also benefit, like I said, the county long term. So, you know, they'll try and use it for operating feeling. expenses. You go. Well, Absent some other really good ideas, that's probably what'll happen with it. Yeah. You know, that's why I think okay, again, we, we probably owe it to um, everybody in the county to be. You're gonna have so many people going after that ARPA money to the state that it's gonna be <laughs> it's gonna be crazy. <laughs> you know, you can't. I, I don't know. I can't even imagine how many people are gonna to try to get their hands on. On that money for different projects. Well, as long as we're near the head of the line, I guess that's be nice if we were. <laughs> but yeah. For some reason, we don't seem to have the clout, you know, on this end of the state anymore. To get on the capital list. Used to be a time we did. All right, that's all I had for the part two of my report. All right, in the old business, new business, new grant policy and procedure. This was just uh, mostly a format refresh. Uh, the community grant procedure was pretty dated. Yeah. Um, so we reformatted it so it matches our, our template. Um, I did make a few minor changes, but nothing substantive. Um, okay, last year? No, no, somewhere else. Yeah. Um, to do the screen. I move to approve the updated community grant policy and procedure as presented today. We got a second. He's on mute. <laughs> okay, I second. <laughs> All in favor? I had to run and get a battery charger. My battery's going dead. Hi, Ben Nelson. Hi, George Hebert. Hi, Joe Osgood. The CFA, CDFA, uh, CFDA, 2102072. 2021 ARPA grant to continue partial funding of Newport's Victim Witness Coordinator and Assistance Program for the VOCA initiatives. Motion requested for authorization to apply. Uh, I move to apply for the grant to continue partial funding of Newport Victim Witness Coordinator and Assistance Program. Uh, 
Director uh, Heather Delaney and Amber Whipple for the Vote Victim of Crime Act initiatives and to authorize the county attorney's office to submit a grant application for FY23 partial funding of the victim witness program coordinator and assistant VOCA initiatives from the CFDA 21027-2021 Arbor Grant VOCA funding opportunity. Second. All in favor? I Ben Nelson. Hi, Joe Cheever. Hi, Joe Osgood. And we need a motion to authorize county manager to apply for CDFA capacity building tax credit grant program. We'll do that next, okay. next time, yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll wait and I'll get the, the job description that you asked for and we can talk about that next time. I'm sure we texted or chatted me to say that we had two other motions that were related to the micro enterprise. Sharon, I don't see anywhere in the script. One so of those there was nothing in the script. Tim sent this late. And okay. both these, um, the code of ethics and the grievance procedures were done last year when the uh, micro enterprise application was submitted, uh, November 21st. Uh, one so of the forms actually had uh, Georgia's signature on it, and the other had your signature on it, the grievance one. I've got the grievance one. I've got the code of ethics. Okay, so we just need a motion okay. to authorize uh, the, what, we, what was the term that was me or you, we were the designated? Uh, the uh, designated? Yeah, authorized official. Okay. I, I would move we uh, adopt that. Uh, Grievance procedure, grievance, and what was the other one? Ethics. 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 ethics um, and uh, have um, Commissioner Hebert uh, sign them. Or authorized or, designate. Or, or, uh, or Derek Furlan as yeah. authorized designate or something. I'll second that. All in favor? Ivan Nelson. Hi, George Hebert. All right. Thanks, Hi, Joe. Was good. Thank you. Okay, let's see in minutes. Okay. Three minutes. Oh, okay. I don't see them. Oh, wait a minute. We got an extra tab. Yep. I got them. Something in there? Yeah, behind the orange tab. It's mine was orange. Yeah, eleven. This one. Okay. Yeah. That extra taps. Yeah. We'll stop that and test. <laughs> I would move the approve the minutes of January 10th as presented. I'll second that. In favor? Ivan Nelson. Hi, George Hebert. Hi, Joe Osgood. Okay. 12 is non public track. Yeah. Um, so it's non public, not a non meeting. All right. I would. Will we adjourn to go in uh, non public for RSA 91A 32A for the dismissal um, promotion or compensation of any public employee? Second. In favor? I have Ben Nelson. Hi, Joe Achiever. Hi, Joe Osgood. Meetings adjourned. Have a motion. Well, we'll go in a non public oh, right. come back in the public. Manager. So, while well, I'm going to, um, Commissioner Osgood, I'm going to probably send you another Zoom link if you want to do it on the screen. Uh, it doesn't matter if you want to do it on phone, we can do it. Okay, it's up to you. Okay.
All right. Let me any, um, let me try to pause definitely these. be more. That'll definitely be more secure. Okay. Recording stopped. <laughs>